Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast, LDS Discussions Edition. I am one of your hosts for today, John DeLynn. It's December 20th, 2022, and we have uh, another episode in our amazing series with LDS Discussions. Today, uh, the episode is the Kinderhook Plates. Um, really quickly, I need to plug this every time for those who don't know. Um, the, the LDS Discussions series is based on an amazing website at ldsdiscussions.com created by our friend Mike, and it's basically an attempt to address, to explore, and to evaluate Mormon Church truth claims dispassionately, evidence-based, neutrally, objectively, as, as much as that is possible, um, based on the evidence. And so we are, by my count, uh, this this will be the 33rd episode in the uh, LDS discussion series. It builds, all these episodes build on each other. So we really recommend that you start at the beginning with episode one and, uh, and that will help you understand today's episode uh, much, much better. Um, and uh, of course, I just want to make sure people understand that you can get the entire series in serial, either at Spotify in both audio and video format, or on the i, uh, I the Apple Podcast app, or you can go to the Mormon Stories Podcast YouTube channel, and there's a playlist there where you can either watch them all or, or listen to them all in succession, or refer them to a friend or a family member. And of course, LDSDiscussions.com is the website where you can see it all. And uh, just so that I can give a little bit of context for today's episode and why it's so important, uh, you know, one of the main claims that Joseph Smith made uh, was that that um, he was a translator. And if you look at, as I understand it, the original version of the Doctrine and Covenants, God or Jesus themselves declare Joseph Smith a prophet, seer, revelator, and translator. And so if God and Jesus are introducing Joseph Smith as a translator, it's really important that Joseph Smith uh, show himself to be an accurate translator. We have already covered the Book of Mormon translation in the LDS discussion series. We have also talked uh, about the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham. And I, you know, not to in any way try and persuade people one way or the other, but I think we've already conclusively showed that uh, by any stretch, along with the Joseph Smith translation of the King James Bible, those are all problematic translations by any objective account. And the reason why today's episode is important is because the Kinderhook Plates is sort of the final or one of the final major uh, ways that we can evaluate Mormon God or Jesus and or Joseph Smith's claim to be uh, a translator. And so that's what we're covering today. We're covering the Kinderhook Plates. And this is definitely, in my estimation, one of the top five or ten most important um, topics to study if you really want to understand uh, Joseph Smith's uh, credibility and his truth claims. And so without any further ado, I welcome Mike back from LDS Discussions. Hey, Mike. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. It's good to be back. And, I, you know, this one for me is going to be one of the, you know, if I look at the project on the website, like all the overview topics, this is one uh, that I was excited to talk about uh, more so than some others, kind of like the last 116 pages, because this episode, to me, the Kinderhook plates by themselves are not, to me, the biggest issue. It's everything around the Kinderhook plates that we learn about Joseph Smith and uh, pro prophets and, and the church from from his point all the way up until our, our, our time. And I think that it's like the plates are what we all focus on. We all focus on the partial translation that Joseph Smith gives, and we're going to cover that in a lot of detail. But to me, the really important part is how that meshes with all of the other episodes we've done thus far. And when I talk about um, how when you look at apologetics, you have to take it in totality. Uh, this is this episode is the perfect illustration of that. And so this episode is going to have a lot of tie-ins into earlier episodes and kind of to show why um, these are not one-off problems and that these are common threads. Um, so I'm really excited about this one just because I think it's going to give um, a different spin or a different angle on the Kinderhook plates than you might get just from looking at like the CES letter or a letter from my wife or something like that. So I'm, I'm excited about this one. I love it. 
All right, Mike. Well, thanks again for all you do and for this amazing series. And if having Mike on weren't enough, we are thrilled to have back with us Nemo the Mormon from the Nemo the Mormon YouTube channel. Hey, Nemo. Hi, everyone. How you been Merry doing? Christmas. Merry Christmas. I'm all right. Yeah? I'm all right. You doing all right? Mm hmm Okay. I'm well, excited. Yeah. Any any initial thoughts on uh, Kinderhook plates? <laughs> Kinderhook plates are a very strange tale, and I feel like they really deserve a deep dive, so I'm really excited to kind of get stuck in and, and investigate the, the twists and turns of this story. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, without any further ado, uh, Mike, let's jump in. Should we start with the slides? Yeah, let's just jump in because we're right. going to kind of give you a quick overview of the Kinderhook plates and then we'll kind of pull back and, and then do more of a, a deep dive into the whole timeline, which we've done a lot on this series. All right. So, Mike, what are the Kinderhook plates? So, this is kind of how the story was known at the time. So, on April 16th, 1843, um, a man named Robert Wiley began an excavation in Kinderhook, Illinois. And he claimed that he had the same dream three nights in a row uh, to dig for artifacts. And if that sounds familiar, it's because that's a common treasure digging uh, idea that you'd have these visions to tell you where to dig, right? And so right away, we've got treasure digging elements, power of three as well, three nights, power of three. We've talked about how in, in magic, it's so common to have three times. Um, we talked about how like with the lost 116 pages, Joseph had to ask God three times before um, God would allow Martin Harris to take the pages. And those little details are important for the story. Um, and so because the dig was so exhaustive, he asked for additional help. And then ultimately, as soon as he got that additional help and witnesses, um, he found what are now known as the Kinderhook plates, along with skeletal remains and other artifacts about 10 feet deep into the ground. And so... Um, if you'll remember, I'm just kind of giving a little foreshadowing here. Um, Joseph Smith, when he was doing the treasure digging for Josiah Stoll, had claimed that there was the treasure that he could see with the rock in the hat. And he actually said that the treasure was buried with a feather. And then all of a sudden the next day, uh, when he's got, you know, all Josiah Stoll near, he digs up the feather and says, oh my goodness, the treasure sank into the ground, but we found the feather. So we know that there was treasure there. And um, Josiah Stoll, who is a, a a witness for Joseph who actually supports him tells a story to, uh, as proof that you could find uh, these ancient remains. And uh, as we talked about in that episode, it, it's completely made up. It's planted evidence because feathers can only last in the ground. I want to say 60 days before they disintegrate. And so um, the idea that they could be buried with, with the treasure is, is impossible. And so in the same um, story, we're already going to get this element of planting um, evidence into the ground um, to basically show that you've, uh, backed up your your visionary experience in those three dreams. Um, the Kinderhook plates were a group of six bell-shaped brass plates. Um, they were covered in unknown symbols. Um, and then among the group that was digging with Wiley on that last day was a member of the LDS church. And so word spreads quickly of this discovery. It's, it's very similar to the book of Abraham Papyrus, where all of a sudden um, Michael Chandler is in the area and once members of the church start hearing about it, like, oh my goodness, guys, this is amazing. We have a prophet who can... Uh, decipher this. And so because uh, Wiley was smart enough to put uh, someone from the church near him, he knew that they would bring it to Joseph Smith. And ultimately these plates do reach Joseph Smith. And soon after Joseph Smith is going to translate a portion of the plates, um, according to his scribe, William Clayton. And this is what the history of the tree history of the church reads um, with regards to this. It says, I insert facsimiles of the six brass plates found near Kinderhook. I have translated a portion of them and they and find they contain the history of the person with whom they were found. He was a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and that he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. All right. So immediately, man, this is explosive because Joseph's basically doing the same thing he did with the papyrus. He's seeing something that looks ancient to him. He thinks about his you know, existing knowledge of the Bible and specifically the Old Testament. And then he's just like on the spot, not only declaring them as being ancient, but declaring them as being associated with Egypt and with Abraham. And then and then he's uh, publishing it in a church publication. So like, th this is important because if, if this, if, you know, if Joseph's, tr if, if the, if the Kinderick plates turn out to be authentic and Joseph Smith's translation of them turn out to be authentic, then thumbs up to Joseph and his claim to be a translator. But if it turns out to be fraudulent, then that's going to poison, you know, 
the Book of Abraham and with that potentially the Book of Mormon and the Book of Moses as well. I mean, that's that's what my ob- objective mind does. My, Mike and Nemo, Nemo, you tell me if that makes sense to you, and then Mike, you can you can also. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. A couple of things that jump out to me from that PowerPoint slide are that um, well, there was a member of the church digging with them. So if anyone tries to tell you members of the church wouldn't go treasure digging, ergo Joseph Smith wouldn't have possibly gone treasure digging. Just, well, by the church's own admission, members of their church would go treasure digging. Uh, and then the other thing is that he's done the same thing here that he did with the Book of Abraham, where he's confused Pharaoh as being like a, a personal, like a, like a name, mm. essentially, rather than a title, because he talks about Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Yeah, yeah. And Robert Rittner made it really clear, mm-hmm. Pharaoh is not a historical figure, it's a title. Is that right, Mike? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, you know, right off the bat... You could see that this idea of the translation, even if you kind of ignore, like if we pretended we didn't have the kinder plates to compare to, you would know right off the bat it, it doesn't work just because of that error. Um, but yeah, that's obviously um, a carryover from the book of Abraham because as we'll get into later, um, there's a lot of ties to the book of Abraham within this episode of the kinder plates. But Mike, am I, am I overstating the stakes here just in my framing of what I've heard so far in your view? It, it depends on how you, like for me, um, when I started doing the deep dive, the Kinderhook plates never stuck out to me at, for, at the very first they did. The more I read into it, the the less important the Kinderhook plates became. And then I started to do the, the deeper dive and then I started seeing the ties to the other problems. And that's when it became more explosive and more important to me. Um, so I think to your point, um, this is an area, and we'll, we actually will talk about this near the end of the presentation, but this is an area where Joseph Smith is given a very testable moment where he can prove himself a prophet or prove that he doesn't have that connection to God to know, to discern truth from, from fiction. And so to me, it's, it's a really important episode, even though, as we'll talk about from an apologetic standpoint, they'll say, well, he's just copying from the, uh, from the Gale, from the Egyptian alphabet. Um, and we'll get into all of that later, but yeah, it, it, a lot of times we try um, from an apologetic standpoint to water down what happened so that you can make it, you know, as, um, as little to nothing as you can, but but the reality is, and we'll, we'll, as we get, go through the apologetics, this will be more understandable. Every time you try to fix one problem with apologetics, you're creating another. And the Kinderhook plates, that's why to me they're so important and, and explosive in a way, is because they have ties to different areas. As Nemo said, right off the bat, you've got ties to treasure digging, and the fact that we have members of the church who are going with this person, um, believing that he's going to find this ancient record, um, and it also shows um, a little bit of how gullible people in this time frame were to see these plates come out of the earth and immediately think this ties to the book of Mormon, this ties to the book of Abraham. Um, and it just shows that Joseph Smith had a chance here to be able to discern truth from fiction and he failed. Okay. Well, you just gave the ending away, Mike. Yeah, I know, but the, <laughs> trust me, the, the, the twist and t- the, like, I, I know this sounds weird to say, but the twists and turns of the story, I think are more important than the plates themselves. And so that's the area where like, well, as I started kind of researching this more and you start to see all these connections to me as like a total, like a nerd. Like I had this dorky, like, wow, this is really cool. Like we talked about in the early episodes about the puzzle and the puzzle pieces fitting together. The Kinderhook plates help you to, to put the pieces together of Mormonism in a really cool way because you start to see the connections. You start to see how Joseph Smith is doing things and how he's not doing things. Um, and, and to me, it helps a lot of other areas, it, which we'll get into. And that's why I think the Kinderhook plates in a lot of ways um, by themselves, I don't think they're as big of a deal as a lot of other people do, but I think they bolster the problems of these other issues. And that's why yeah. no matter what you do here, if you want to water them down, you still are left with all of these other issues, which we'll get into, um, which are really problematic once you get into that second layer of um, like truth claims of Mormonism. All right. Well, let's jump to the next slide. The Kinderick plates generated excitement among early Mormons. Yeah. And so after, you know, the, these Kinderhook plates are found and word is spreading. And of course, everybody, especially after the book of Abraham discovery is thinking this is amazing. And so the times and season, which, um, obviously is a church owned newspaper. I believe at this time it was being edited by John Taylor. I'm not positive, but I think it is. Um, they wrote an article about it and it says, we learn there was a Mormon present when the plates were found, who it is said leapt for joy at the discovery and remarked that it would go to prove the authenticity of the Book of Mormon, which it undoubtedly will. Um, And then this was followed up by a publication um, of a broadside in the Nauvoo Neighbor that included uh, that Times Times and Seasons editorial along with the facsimiles of all 12 plates because there's six plates with with two sides. Um, And then the note that 
the contents of the plates will be published in the times and seasons as soon as the translation is completed. And so at least at this point, there's an expectation that Joseph Smith is going to be translating them. And there's also this belief among early members of the church that this is going to prove the Book of Mormon true because, of course, finding plates with with Egyptian characters would would obviously correlate to the Book of Mormon claiming to have reformed Egyptian characters on, on gold plates. So there's a lot of excitement, and obviously everybody is thinking these are authentic right off the bat. Nemo? You know what's mad about this is that Joseph Smith went through so much effort to hide the gold plates from people, and now he's just sticking whatever he's translating in the newspaper. It it shows a real progression of his in his confidence and in his in his uh, feeling that he has control over the situation. That you know he was a little farm boy trying to produce the Book of Mormon, and he was having to hide these gold plates from everyone so they couldn't see them. Um, but these six twelve plates. Uh, these these twelve you know plates come about and all of a sudden they can go in the newspaper and the papyri you can charge people money to come and see them, you know. Mm. Yeah, no, it's 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 an element of this too that's amazing because this idea with the Book of Mormon is that these plates are being buried and Joseph Smith is the only one who can dig them out and as we talked about in all of those episodes early on nobody can really look at them right I know the witnesses claim to have seen them but nobody sees them physically during the time of the of the translation. But as Nemo said, that's because at that point, that was the control Joseph Smith had with the Kinderhook plates he doesn't have control over. He cannot really stop members from seeing it. And so I don't think he can really tell them you can't publish it because the person that found them is already showing them to everybody. And it just shows how, and this is a theme throughout these slides as we'll get into, when Joseph Smith is not in control of a situation, um, he acts much differently than when he is because the whole power that you hold as a treasure digger or as a prophet is that you need people to believe that you are in control of the situation if you want to be believed and have that charismatic leadership. And right. as Nemo pointed out, right off the bat here, Joseph Smith has really no control over this, and that is going to put him in a situation that is just extremely right. difficult. And uh, and for those who are listening, we just want to let you know that, that we're showing on the screen visuals not only of the Times and Seasons article, but, uh, you know, representations, visual representations of the plates themselves. And and again, what, what what's important to me about this is I'm trying to, you know, assess this uh, objectively, is that clearly Joseph Smith and the church felt like these were authentic and that this was an important discovery or they would have never... Uh, publish them in the times and seasons. So that's, to me, that's a really significant endorsement. And I'm guessing later the church is going to try and dismiss and downplay the Kinderhook plates, but but there's no way they can credibly do that if they're taking the time and effort and expense to be visually representing them in the church's official publication, the times and seasons. Does that sound right, Mike? Yeah, I think the Times and Seasons did not put the facsimiles in. That was in the Nauvoo neighbor, which I don't think the church owned. Um, but Wait, the thing we're put... looking at right now is not the Times and Seasons? So the Times and Seasons article is quoted, and then the Nauvoo neighbor is going to take the Times and Seasons article, reproduce it into theirs, and then okay, underneath it put it. the facsimiles. So they're combining. The Nauvoo neighbor combines the Times and Seasons article and then puts their own puts the facsimile okay, images sorry, in there as well. But, but who's, who is in control of the Nauvoo neighbor? I don't know for sure, actually. I'm okay. not sure who who was in charge. Who owned okay, it or okay, whatever. okay. I mean, but it's okay. Thank you for the historical accuracy and the clarification. To me, if I'm just trying to analyze it objectively, it's still having the ring of church sanction, sort of the advertising and discussion of this topic. Is that fair, Mike? Yeah, you went. I you, think. Oh, yeah, I think it's. I mean, it's fair. I mean, the article itself is telling you that this is going to prove the Book of Mormon true. So obviously, okay. the people in charge of the Times and Season who are going to be, I don't know if Joseph Smith was still the editor at this point. I know at the very end he handed off that that kind of um, control of the, the Times and Season. I think it might have been John Taylor. But regardless, top leaders of the church are publishing this and telling members this is going to prove the Book of Mormon true. So there is no indication in any way that there is any skepticism or doubt towards the authenticity of these plates. Okay. And other important things that were published in the Times and Seasons include sections of Doctrine and Covenants, like DNC 1 was published in the Times and Seasons, and the Book of Abraham was published as a serial in the Times and Seasons. Before we have DNC together as it is today, um, a lot of it was published in the church's newspaper. 
Okay. Yep. And, and just to clarify, all right, so I looked this up. The Navajo Neighbor was uh, published and edited by John Taylor. So that is uh, eventually the third. Source. He's the third prophet of the church, right? Yeah. So so he, the third prophet of the church, is going to publish the facsimiles with the Times and Seasons article and basically tell members that there's an expectation within the church that there is going to be a full translation coming soon. Um, which again, that's really important. So this is not some outsider who's like trying to paraphrase or misquote a, a leader. This is John Taylor, the third prophet of the church, who is very, very much involved in all of the um, kind of things with yeah, Joseph Smith at this insane. point, telling us, yes, this is. He was in. He was in Carthage jail. He, wasn't he in mm-hmm. Carthage jail when Joseph was murdered? Was. Yeah. Saved yeah. by his pocket watch. Yep. And Nemo, you were laughing. Did you want to add anything? Just to- I was just laughing at the fact that we were trying to work out who this was, and it turns out it is absolutely from the church's playbook. Not only is it someone adjacent to Joseph, so they could possibly try and work plausible deniability in this because they didn't publish it in their main newspaper. They published it in like John Taylor's paper, the same way that they got members of the church to buy Mark Hoffman's forgeries rather than buying them directly themselves. This pattern's been there since the beginning of the church using people that are very clearly associated with them and very clearly acting for them, but there's just that one step removed. Yep. Okay, got it. Okay, well, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, which is the problem for the Kinderhook plates. Yeah, and this is going to be kind of where the turn happens. And so until 1980, you know, 40 years ago, uh, the church claimed that the Kinderhook plates were authentic and proof of Joseph Smith's abilities and truthfulness as a prophet. Um, and But the problem is, in 1981, the church was forced to change their narrative on the Kinderhook plates because testing proved that the plates were a hoax, as the cre- creators had claimed. And we'll get into all that as we go through the timeline. And this is from the 1981 um, Enzyme. A recent electronic and chemical analysis of a metal plate, one of the six original Kinderhook plates, uh, brought in 1843 to the prophet Joseph Smith in Nauvoo, Illinois, appears to solve a previously unanswered question in church history, helping to further evidence that the plate is what its producers later said it was, a 19th century attempt to lure Joseph Smith into making a translation of ancient-looking characters that had been etched into the plates. It's so slimy. Yeah. That is, what, yeah. What, so slimy. that they Keep set that a trap? Screen. That they set a trap for Joseph? Or what? what's slimy, Nemo? Keep that up on screen. Okay, okay. Um, what is really slimy about this is the way that they say it appears to solve a previously unanswered question in church history, as though they've been asking this question, which they weren't because they were making an affirmative statement that they were true, helping to further evidence that the plate is what its producers later said it was, a 19th century attempt to lure Joseph Smith into making a translation, etc. A further evidence, again, as though it's furthering their purpose, as though it's fur- furthering what they were trying to do in finding evidence that it was a hoax all along and that weren't these people trying to trick Joseph when actually they were maintaining that these things were real and they were trying to deny the testimony of those that said it was a hoax. So it's just, it's really slimy wordplay to try and act as though all along, this is what the church does. They'll change the narrative. They'll change something. They'll change for the strength of youth. They'll change whatever. And then rather than admit that they were wrong, they'll try and act as though that's the way things always were. And if you thought differently, that's your fault. So that's just textbook gaslighting. Is that what you're textbook saying? Textbook gaslighting. Absolutely textbook yeah. gaslighting. Because the church wanted everyone to think it was authentic and that it bolstered Joseph's credibility up until mm-hmm. 1980. And then all of a sudden they're saying, we well, knew, the, it, was, we knew it was a fraud all along, right? Yeah, yeah, getting ahead of the story because they know this is going to come out. They know that like the tanners okay. are going to pick this up. Got Other it. people are going to pick this up. So they got to get ahead of it. Got it. Yeah. They're very lucky this didn't happen in 2022 because they would not be able to stop the, you know, kind of internet age of just like p- completely destroying the fact that they had, as we'll get into, claim that these were authentic. So this statement that's made in 1981 it would never fly in 2022. I mean, I guess it would with members who don't look beyond what the church is telling them. But yeah, it's, to Nemo's point, this is they're trying to get out ahead of it, and they're still doing it in a time frame where they can control information a lot better than they can today. All right, let's go to the next slide, the timeline of the Kinderick plates. Yeah, and so this is just, um, you know, we've done timelines in our previous episodes because the timelines to me are so important to understanding um, how these stories change and evolve and how the church's perspectives change and evolve. So we did this on the first vision, the Book of Mormon translation, the priesthood restoration, polygamy. And by doing it, it really helps you to understand uh, not just what actually happened, but how the church has completely redefined what happened. And so we're going to try to go through this in the best, you know, the Kinder plates don't have a ton of documents to really pull from, but just to, this will give you a good picture of, of what happens. And so 
as we mentioned earlier, this starts in, on April 16th, 1843. Um, Robert Wiley begins his dig in Kinderhook, Illinois, which leads to the discovery of the Kinderhook plates. Um, on May 1st, 1843, so two weeks later, um, William Clayton is going to make a journal entry about the Kinderhook plates with Joseph's partial translation included in his notes. Um, we read this earlier. I'm just going to read it real quick. It says, I have seen six brass plates which were found in Adams County. Um, uh, Adams County. But it's Pike Okay, County. wait, wait. By can I ask you a question, Mike? Yeah. So when when William Clayton writes I, is he writing as if he's Joseph Smith? Is he writing Joseph Smith's dictation? Or is this William Clayton saying he's seen six brass plates? So William Clayton typically writes like Joseph did this, President Joseph did this. So okay. I think this is him saying it. And if when we get about halfway through the quote, you're going to see him kind of turn to saying what Joseph Smith is doing. Got it. And, and so I think that might be him. It's it's a little tricky just because he is recording the day-to-day events of Joseph Smith along with being his scribe. And so okay. you're going to get a little bit of that where it's a little confusing. But I think that could be him saying it and then saying what Joseph Smith okay. you know, said they were. Okay, got, got it. Please so continue. It says, I have seen six brass plates which were found in Adams, Pike County, by some persons who were digging in a mound. They found a skeleton about six feet from the surface of the earth, which was nine foot high, um, which is, of course— You know, that's a lot of people believe that ancient people were ridiculously tall and lived hundreds of years. Um, And then it says, at this point, there is a tracing of a plate in the journal. Uh, The plates were on the breast of the skeleton. This diagram shows the size of the plates being drawn on the edge of one of them. They are covered with ancient characters of language containing from 30 to 40 on each side of the plates. President Joseph has translated a portion and says they contain the history of the person with whom they were found, and he was a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and that he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven, uh, heaven and earth. And so that's just setting up that, and that's that's from the original journal. That's not in the history of the church when they do change it to first just, person. And so that just shows, because we'll get into it later. But a lot of people want to say William Clayton just made that up, and, and so we're reading it now so you can kind of understand that. He's not making it up because he's with Joseph, um, and that is his original entry. I just have to say that I've made this point in previous episodes, but this curse of Cain thing, you know, Christians who love the Bible like to always remind us that there's no curse of Cain dark skin in in the New Testament or in the Old Testament. Um, And it took a prophet like Joseph Smith to insert dark skin as a curse into scripture. And we've already talked about how the Book of Mormon has not the curse of Cain, but the curse of the Lamanites with dark skin, and that he injects the curse of Cain into the Book of Abraham and the Book of Moses. So he sort of codifies scriptural racism into, you know, those books. And now we have him codifying again the curse of Cain, because of course, you know, the way I understand it, um, this ham, you know, if, if you're basically talking about ham and you're Joseph Smith, you're talking about the curse of Cain, um, you know, uh, descending through the through the loins of Noah and his descendants through Egyptus or whatever. And you, you guys may or may not agree with me, but to me, this sort of makes it uh, sort of like a grand slam. Joseph can't help but codify curse of Cain racism into every scripture he touches. Um, and, and Nemo and Mike, you guys can tell me if I've got that wrong. Yeah. It's, it's like, he's got these beats that he's got to hit when he's translating these things. He's got to He's got to make sure he shoehorns ham him. He's got to get Pharaoh in there as a proper noun, as a, as a person, you know, uh, it, that's what he's got to do every time. Uh, to, to, that's his idea of consistency. I think Mike, are, are yeah. you going to, are you going to tell me I'm wrong on that one? Well, it's just, I think it's one of those things where I don't, I don't know if Joseph Smith is thinking in terms of like, I need to tie this into the curse of ham. I think he's trying to find a way to tie it into the book of Abraham to give it credibility through what he's done. Um, and I think as we'll go through it, it creates problems, but yeah, I, I think that he's trying to, in his head, he's thinking I've made the book of Abraham all about Egypt and now I have these kinderhook plates and I, I need to tie them into Egyptian because the characters look like they might be Egyptian. And so I think it's just, he doesn't really, you know, he's, he's, I don't want to say he's a one trick pony on this, but I think he's got a, like Nemo said, he's got a playbook. Like these are the things I'm trying to emphasize about, um, where my theology is with regard to ancient Egypt. And so I think he just goes to it. And as we'll get to, um, as we go uh, through the apologetics, obviously that is because he's trying to tie the kinderhook plates to the Egyptian alphabet, 
um, in order to um, you know kind of make it work with what he's done with the book Abraham. You okay. also can't blame him because you know in his in his um, cultural milieu, as people like to say, uh, in the in the waters in which he was swimming, language made up of symbols rather than traditional sort of Latinized characters or even Hebrew, um, that is Egyptian to those people in their heads. It's yep. a fo- so any anything they come across where there's a language written out in pictograms, they're going to think it's something to do with Egyptian. That's why Joseph Smith went for reformed Egyptian when he was talking about the characters on the Book of Mormon plates. That's why, you know, he, he looked at the Egyptian language and felt like he could get all these vast paragraphs out of each symbol because, you know, that's the way he made the Book of Mormon plates work. Uh, and so that's what he's doing again. So you can't blame him for for pushing on the Egypt idea so heavily because that's the waters he was swimming in. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess the other thing that's really crucial to me about this quote is that, you know, Joseph's main scribe or one of his main scribes at the time is writing in his journal that Joseph, he's just confirming that, that as a firsthand witness that Joseph Smith, uh, you know, claimed the origins of these plates and commenced, um, you know, translating them, and that's really important uh, eyewitness testimony, as far as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it is. He's I um, mean, it, yeah. Sorry, he he's no, also uh, he. If you pull that quote up, he's also essentially saying that Lehi and Nephi are descendants of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, because how else are like how how else is a is a skeleton buried with these plates being found in North America if he didn't even come if he didn't either come with Lehi and Co or yeah. with uh, the Jaredites? That's weird. Yeah. I didn't even think. So about he's that. got to tie either of those groups directly to the royalty of Egypt mm. and Ham. Uh, yeah, it's just that's weird. Interesting. Yeah, you're right. Because in that's two slides, <laughs> in two slides, we're going to have a quote from uh, Parley Platt that Parley Pratt that kind of actually does what you're doing, Nemo, which is all of a sudden now you got to figure out why are these people in the Americas when the Book of Mormon is saying that there was no one here. And that's actually a really good point that's going to be addressed. And I didn't think about it either just because I just wasn't thinking that way. But yeah, that, that's a big problem when you're trying to tie the Book of Abraham to America. Really quickly, Mike, are you going to be covering kind of who Robert Wiley is and what his motives might have been later? Or are you not covering yes. that? Yeah, so later in the timeline, we're going to talk about Robert Wiley and kind of what he says his motivations were. Uh, we don't go into a ton of detail just because, you know, the, we don't have, I don't even know if there is a ton of detail in his background, but yeah, we will definitely cover kind of why he did it. Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go uh, to the next slide. Yep. Yeah. And so the next slide, this is what we already talked about, so we don't have to spend much time on it. But the same day that Joseph Smith is going to write, or have William Clayton uh, write down in his journal the partial translation. Um, the Times and Seasons prints a letter to the editor, um, discusses the Kinderhook plates, their history, and the hope it would go to prove the authenticity of the Book of Mormon, which it undoubtedly will. Um, and so, you know, it just says, like, this little paragraph here says, by whom these plates were deposited there must ever remain a secret unless someone skilled in deciphering hieroglyphics may be found to unravel the mystery. Some pretend to say that Smith, the Mormon leader, has the ability to read them. If he has, he will confer a great favor on the public by removing the mystery which hangs over them. We learn there was a Mormon present when the plates were found, who it is said leapt for joy at the discovery and remarked that it would go to prove the authenticity of the Book of Mormon, which it undoubtedly will. And so it just shows that they're almost setting up Joseph Smith here to be the person that that brings forth this mysterious translation um, and obviously operating under the assumption that these plates are authentic. I mean, the logic mm-hmm. there isn't outstanding because, you know, Joseph would have a motive to quote, translate the Kinderick plates in a way that would, would validate the authenticity of the book of Mormon. Right. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. like that you wouldn't, so That's- that wouldn't necessarily be an independent va- validation. Right. No, no, but yeah, that and that, and that's what where he's at right now. And you know, you have like Nemo mentioned earlier, like you have to tie it to the Book of Mormon, but he already tied it to the Book of Abraham. So now you have to that then you would have to to kind of, you know, what's I don't know what the phrase is, square that circle or circle that square. You'd have to then try to triangulate these three things. And so I, I do feel like this is what happens. We talked about this um in previous episodes. This is what happens when you're I used to say when you're orally dictating like DNC one thirty two or the Book of Mormon, but when you're just kind of making it up as you go along you create these problems. Like Nemo said, all of a sudden 
if you're tying it to the book of Abraham, how did it get to America? And so had he done any more translation on this, yeah, that would have been something he would have had to have done Mm -hmm. to find a way to bolster the book of Mormon while also confirming the book of Abraham and trying to avoid those contradictions. And so, yeah, they're, they've already created a problem yeah. for Joseph Smith before he even began. Nemo, anything you want to add? Well, this throws the catalyst theory like under the bus when it comes to the book of Abraham. So if you go back to the previous episodes we've done on the book of Abraham, a lot of people say that the way the book of Abraham actually works is that the papyri were just a thing to inspire Joseph. But this quote here shows that there were people around in Joseph Smith's time who believed he could translate hieroglyphics. They believed that's what he was doing. And along with all the other mountains of evidence that that's what Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith himself believed he was doing, this just adds another nail to that coffin, that the the culture around him, the people around him, also thought that he could literally translate hieroglyphics. All right. Thanks, Nemo. That's great. All right. Well, let's no, go to the next slide, which is Apostle Parley Pratt compares the Kinnerhook Plates to the Book of Abraham. Yeah, and this one's an important one, and actually it's even more important now that Nemo mentioned the Book of Mormon connection to the Kinderhook plates. But So this is May 7th, so now we're six days after Joseph Smith's partial translation. Apostle Parley Pratt can comments on the Kinderhook plates comparing their look to the Book of Abraham Papyrus, and he says, Six plates having the appearance of brass have lately been dug out of a mound by a gentleman in Pike County, Illinois. They are small and filled with engravings in Egyptian language and contain the genealogy of one of the ancient Jaredites back to Ham, the son of Noah. His bones were found in the same vase made of cement. Part of the bones were 15 feet underground. A large number of citizens have seen them and compared the characters with those on the Egyptian papyrus, which is now in the city. So this is an important quote to show that everyone around Joseph Smith is under the assumption they're true, which is only going to happen if Joseph Smith is telling them about the fact that this has to do with um, the you know the genealogy of ancient Jaredites. And so to Nemo's point, it does seem like that's how he's going to tie this both to the Book of Abraham and also to the Book of Mormon by saying that this is actually one of the Jaredites um, that came out of out of the uh, loins of Ham. And so I, it just seems like he's he's already kind of weaving a very complicated web here, but obviously, this quote to me is important because Parley Press not going to just make this up. So he's getting this um, from Joseph Smith. All right. So that's a second witness, so to speak, an apostolic witness that, that Joseph has declared these authentic and that he's, um, that he's pursuing to translate them, right? Yeah. Even in and, and the thing is like, you'll hear, we'll get into it later. People say, oh, it's a partial translation and that's fine. It is a partial translation, but it's still a translation. You know, it's like, if you do a partial test and you fail at, you can't then say, well, I only took, you know, a quarter of the test. You, you still failed what you took. And so, I mean, the book um, of Abraham, that, the book of Abraham was a partial translation until it was finished in Nauvoo, right? <laughs> like, yeah, it was still it. scripture. Well, yep. <laughs> yeah. And that's just it. it. You know, it's partial until it's not. And the fact yeah. is he started it and he never, yeah. And we'll get in. He never says, I'm not doing this because it's fake or I'm not doing this because I don't believe it's true. So all we have is what he did. And so yeah. if you if you want to, from an apologetic standpoint, say it's partial, that's fine. It is partial, but we could still assess what he did. Yeah. All right, Nemo, anything you want to add? No, I was just looking into the uh, timeline of the Tower of Babel, uh, which is what causes the Jaredites to kind of come over to the ancient Americas and how that lines up with, because the church says that happened in 22 to 2300 BC. I just wanted to, I was just looking into what the Egyptians were up to at that time, um, you know, seeing if the pharaoh was even a title in use then. But I'll uh, I'll get back to you all and let you know. Okay, all right. That's a good point. Yeah, and that's a good point too because that's again when you start creating this stuff and you're not thinking about all the things that you're going to affect by creating it, it creates a lot of problems. And that's how we can assess it. That's how scholars can look at the Book of Mormon and say those things are anachronistic or that but biblical scholarship didn't happen and yet it's in the Book of Mormon. And we're going to see the same things here. Even with just that partial translation, he's creating problems that we can assess. And so, as I said, that's why I think this episode is really cool because it does tie into all of these different episodes we've already done, I think in a way that will help it make a lot more sense to someone who's trying to kind of put the pieces back together. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide. The Nauvoo Neighbor publishes the facsimiles. Yep. So three days after the Parley Pratt quote, um, the Nauvoo Neighbor, which we just mentioned is run by John Taylor is going to republish the times and seasons letter along with um, facsimiles of all 12 sides of the Kinderhook plates 
Um, then they include the note at the end, which we mentioned, which says the contents of the plates will be published in the times and seasons as soon as the translation is completed, which implies that members were given the impression and John Taylor was given the impression that a full translation was going to come from Joseph Smith. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I can already predict that Joseph Smith's death is probably the only thing that predicts that, that prevents this sort of a prediction or prophecy from coming true. Right. I, I, you know, honestly, I don't know. I mean, I, I, we'll get into this as we go further along, but I do think on some level, Joseph Smith is like very skeptical of the plates because it's kind of like one of those things where he's doing this magic uh, treasure digging with a rock and a hat. Right. And all of a sudden someone comes up to you and they're like, Hey, I just did that same thing and I actually found these plates and Joseph Smith knows it doesn't work, but he's also in that position where he can't say that because that's his background. And so, you know, we'll get into his. You're we, saying we he has second about. thoughts. Joseph eventually has second thoughts. I, I think he's skeptical because okay. I think it, it, it's one of those things we talked about at the beginning of the episode. When you're not in control of a situation, you are very, very much on thin ice because you know yeah. that you don't know the provenance of these, these plates. And you also know uh, that I believe Joseph Smith knew that he created the prop set of the Book of Mormon plates because there were no there were no plates with with reformed Egyptian. That that's not a thing. Well, if so he develops Joseph's if he develops skepticism, uh, it's it's problematic because he he declares early on you know their authenticity oh, yeah. and origin. So. I, you know, I, I think that also comes from the fact that I, I think on some level he can't help himself. You yeah, know? it's the same thing. He, he sees <laughs> uh, obviously with the Egyptian scrolls, he knows those are Egyptian scrolls. They're with mummies. You know, they're they're uh, more established items, but brass plates with uh, engravings that kind of parallel the Book of Mormon. I think he's like, I made up the Book of Mormon plates, but yet here this dude yeah. is, and I don't think they're real. But I also can't say that because if I say there's no such thing as brass plates with with writing, you know what I mean? So yeah, it it, it puts him it, in a real tight spot. So I I kind of wonder if he kind of didn't want to. Be, I, I, I kind of wonder, we'll, we'll get into it later, but I think he was in that position where he didn't want to say, I don't know what these are because he had to have answers for everything in order to have that charismatic leadership. But he also yeah. knows that if he goes too far, he's going to be exposed. And so he was in a no-win situation. It also reminds me of his Zelf the Lamanite declaration of him coming up yeah. on the bones and then the Zelf the yeah. White Lamanite. We're going to add anything, Nemo? Yeah. I was going to say that from my look at that list, we know a lot about what was going on in the world in the 23rd century BC. So the fact that there's some remains that don't really add up to the archaeological evidence that exists within North America, um, yeah, it's just problematic for Joseph Smith it, because it puts a time in it. If you start to say that they're descendants of the Jaredites, that puts a time on him. He's at least yeah. that old. Um, he's maybe a little bit younger. Yeah. Okay. It's all right, let's go to the next slide. The Times and Seasons connects the Book of Mormon and Kinnerick Plates. Okay, so now we're jumping to December 1st, 1843, and the Times and Season is going to make this reference to the Kinderhook Plates. It says, Why does the circumstance of the plates recently found in a mound in Pike County, Illinois, by Mr. Wiley, together with the ethnology and a thousand other things, go to prove the Book of Mormon true? Answer, because it is true. All right, and I'm off so, back to church. Sorry, guys. I mean, that sounds a yeah. little bit circular to me. It's extremely <laughs> circular. It's just... It, it, <laughs> It's one of those ones that's hard to read without having some sarcasm because it's just like, why is it true? Because it is true. And it's just, it's the whole like, Joseph Smith was a prophet because it's true. It's true because Joseph Smith is a prophet and circle and circle and circle. And so it just, the fact that this is in the times and seasons in December of 1843 tells you that the church is still having discussions about this. Members of the church are very excited about it. And at this point, there's no skepticism that they're not true. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide. Wilbur Fugate claims the Kinderhook plates are a fraud. Yeah, so now we're jumping all the way to 1879 because obviously Joseph Smith is going to be killed in 1844, and that effectively just sends the entire church into chaos. Um, so in June of 1879, uh, Wilbur Fugate writes to James Cobb in Salt Lake City. He tells them that the Kinderhook plates were a hoax that were intended to trick Joseph Smith into translating the plates. Um, in the letter, it describes how the plates were faked using acid to etch the, the characters and the process of how they were uncovered and brought to Joseph Smith. Um, and on the website, we have a, a citation to the full text of the affidavit. But effectively, he's saying exactly how they did it and how they used the lore of treasure digging to get one of the people from the church to be there to bring it to Joseph Smith. Like they knew what they were doing. Um, and so that happens in June of 1879. Now, in December of 1890, um, in the Overland Monthly, 
uh, they report about the discovery of the Kinderhook plates. And it says, um, Charlotte Haven said that when Joshua Moore showed them to Joseph, the latter said that the figures or writing on them was similar to that in which the Book of Mormon was written. And if Mr. Moore could leave them, he thought that by the help of revelation, he would be able to translate them. And I find this interesting because here is Charlotte Haven. And, and the reason I put her name in uh, in yellow is because that is a reference that John Gee uses all the time to claim that there was this long scroll for the book of Abraham. They love the Charlotte Haven quote, yet they will never use the Charlotte Haven quote that says that Joseph Smith was going to translate the Kinderhook plates by revelation because later now they're going to want to tell us he wasn't interested. And so, um, so selective use, that, selective use yeah. of evidence when it's convenient for your argument, you're saying. Yeah, it's just, an, it's just one picking. of those inconsistencies. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's inconsistencies in how they approach evidence. And whereas I would go from the standpoint of, yeah, Charlotte Haven probably thought she saw a long scroll because as we talked about in that episode, you know, a two foot long piece of paper to anyone who isn't used to that is going to be like, that's a long scroll. It's not, doesn't yeah. be 30 feet. Um, but anyways, the point is, um, we have this quote, and I think she means Book of Abraham and not Book of Mormon um, because they're comparing the the characters on the papyrus. Obviously, we don't have gold plates to compare to from the Book of Mormon. Um, but the fact is, in, in December of 1890, we have this, this quote saying that Joseph Smith was saying, if you'll leave the plates with me, I will translate them. Um, it, I think it's a questionable quote. It is very long after, but it also um, kind of puts a light on why using Charlotte Haven's quote in the book of Abraham uh, for John Gee about the lost, uh, missing long scroll is problematic just the same. It's a late quote, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's a lot more credible than the idea that these were actually authentic plates stemming back from the time of Noah and Ham. I mean, it's better than anything else we have in terms of their authenticity. Yeah. Isn't that right? No, and, and it lines up too. I mean, it, 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 we'll go through this timeline and kind of the apologetics. She is saying that, She's there, and Joseph Smith saw the pl saw the plates, asked to hold on to them um, so he could help by the power of revelation, which is what he would claim, obviously, for the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham, because even though he's translating them, he's translating them through God's revelation of what the characters are. So it, it, it matches what we have. It's just one of those things where um, we don't have a lot to go with. And so I just find this quote to be interesting because it does show um, that they're comparing to the Book of Abraham papyri. And that Joseph Smith at least is showing interest in translating, which would make sense given the journal entry. Okay, really quickly, I just want to make sure I understand. So you've got Wilbur Fugate who's saying that they were a fraud in 1879. But originally your story had Robert Wiley digging. And so, yeah, so who, are these, who are these who are these characters? So this is a group of people that are doing this. And so it's not just one person. So Robert Wiley is the one who's going to dig him up. Wilbur Fugate is part of that group that's trying to trick Joseph Smith. And he's the only one that's coming out to tell everybody what happened. And so, so Wilbur Robert would Wiley have been a co-conspirator yes. in, the, in the conspiracy to show Joseph Smith the fraud along with Robert Wiley. Correct. Okay. Nemo, do you want to add anything to this slide particularly? Not particularly, other than I hate it when they cherry pick sources. Okay. So let's yes. point that out whenever they do it. Okay. Yep. Well, the one thing I just want to say about, you know, this slide is I'm dying to know how the Mormon church handles sort of, uh, you know, this eruption of evidence that would otherwise disclaim, disprove, or add weight against Joseph Smith's claim to be a translator. Like this is, this should be a bombshell for, for the Mormon church. So I'm just dying to know how they respond to the potential bombshell. Right. Yeah. And the, the next slide is, is a great one for that. Okay. It just shows how we're spinning our wheels here to try to make this work. So let's jump to the next slide, which is BH Roberts, our good friend, BH yeah. Roberts reappears, Apolo early apologist, Beach Roberts declares the hoaxers are the real hoax. Yeah, and so this is from uh, his book, New Witnesses for God. And it says, of this presentation of the matter, it is only necessary to say that it is a little singular that Mr. Fugate alone, out of the three, said to be in collusion in perpetrating the fraud, should disclose it, and that he should wait from 1843 to 1879, a period of 36 years before doing so, when he and those said to be associated with them had such an excellent opportunity to expose the vain pretensions of the prophet, if Fugate's tale be true. And this is really the, the big part. It says, 
For while the statement in the text of the prophet's journal to the effect that the find was genuine and that he had translated some of the characters and learned certain historical facts concerning the person with whose remains the plates were found may not have been known at the time to the alleged conspirators to deceive him, still the editor of the Times and Seasons, John Taylor, the close personal friend of the prophet, took the find seriously and expressed at once explicit confidence in an editorial in the Times and Season on May 1st, 1843, that the prophet could give a translation of the plates. And this attitude the church continued to maintain. For in the prophet, a Mormon weekly periodical published in New York, on the 15th of February, 1845, there was published a facsimile of the Kinderhook plates together with the Times and Seasons editorial in all the above matter of the text. How easy to have covered Joseph Smith and his followers with ridicule by proclaiming the hoax as soon as they accepted the Kinderhook plates as genuine. Why was it not done? The fact that Fugate's story was not told until 36 years after the event and that he alone of all those who were connected with the event gives that version of it, it is, ra is rather strong evidence that his story is the hoax, not the discovery of the plates nor the engravings upon them. And so B.H. Roberts is saying that because William Fugate waited so long to, to proclaim that they were trying to trick Joseph Smith, that clearly his lie is the real hoax and that Joseph Smith his translations are, are completely legitimate. And so B.H. Roberts is admitting that Joseph Smith translated part of it and that the church believed it to be true. And therefore the real hoax is the people claiming it was a hoax, which I think this is a really important one to illustrating how the church is going to stick with preserving Joseph Smith as a prophet against this story from William Fugate, because there's no way really to know one way or the other at this moment. Um, if he's telling the truth. So to me, what's important about this quote, if I'm just summarizing, is we've got B.H. Roberts, you know, apologist for the church, not an apostle, but but church historian. And, you know, I think he's a member of the presidency of the Quorum of the Seventy. Yeah. He's validating Joseph's authentication of the Kinderhook plates, uh, you know, John Taylor's involvement, the Times and Seasons. He's just sort of like, Connecting the dots and doubling doubling down and saying, man, if Joseph said it and John Taylor said it, and if it was published in the Times and Seasons, I'm sticking I'm sticking with the authenticity of Joseph's declaration uh, of the Kinderhook plates. That that's what I'm reading there. Um, yeah. Nemo, anything you want to add? Just that what we're seeing there is him saying, well, he wouldn't have he wouldn't have tried to hurt the church the way I would have if I were in his position. Therefore, he's not telling the truth. But there's, there's loads of reasons why he wouldn't have revealed the fact that it was a hoax. Part of it might have been shock and disbelief that Joseph fell for it in the first place. Yeah. Also, yeah, I like mean, B.H. Roberts is, is a defender of the faith. And so he is, he knows he needs, what this shows is B.H. Roberts knows that he needs to not go with evidence but but to bolster the prophet's credibility, doesn't this show that the Kinderhook plates is a is a threat to Joseph Smith's credibility? That, that yeah. why else would B.H. Roberts spring to Joseph's defense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if if the Kinderhook plates are what we're going to be told today that they are, then B.H. Roberts would have said it really doesn't matter because he only made a partial translation using the Book of Abraham papyri. So who cares? And yet, mm -hmm. what you're going to see is that the church is going to go the other route and say, oh, no, these are authentic. Joseph Smith is a prophet. Therefore, whoever's saying that he made it, they made it up is a liar uh, because Joseph Smith already partially translated it. So they're going to stick with this just as they stuck with, um, and we talked about this with the DNA in the Book of Mormon episode. He had all these initial DNA studies saying Native Americans did not come from Jerusalem. And the church is like, yeah, screw that. They don't know. And then when it got too definitive, then they changed the introduction to the Book of Mormon to say to change it from um, uh, primarily uh, are the pri uh, primary ancestors to among them. I can't remember the exact wording. So it, it just shows that the church is going to privilege Joseph Smith over whatever they need to until they have no other choice. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide, which is the Improvement Era affirms uh, the church's stance on the Kinderick plates. Yep. And so this is from 1904. And so this is an article in the Improvement Era, which is like, you know, the Liahona or the Enzyme. Um, and it's going to confirm that the church believes the Kinderhook plates are authentic. So it says, um, certain bell-shaped plates are said to have been discovered in a mound in the vicinity of Kinderhook, Pike County, Illinois, by Robert Wiley in 1843 and taken to Joseph Smith. Now I wish to ask, one, were those plates translated by Joseph Smith? Two, if so, what were their contents? Three, where are they? 
Four, are they considered of any value in confirming the Book of Mormon? And five, is there anything about them in the in any of the church works? And so their answer to one and two is, uh, near Kinderhook in Pike County, Illinois, between 50 and 60 miles south and east of Nauvoo, on April 23rd, 1843, a Mr. Robert Wiley, while excavating a large mound, took from said mound six brass plates of bell shape, fastened by a ring, passing through the small end, and fastened with two clasps and covered with ancient characters. Human bones, together with charcoal and ashes, were found in the mound in connection with the plates, which evidently had been buried with the person whose bones were discovered. The plates were submitted to the prophet, and speaking of them in his journal, under the date of May 1st, 1843, he says, I have translated a portion of them, and find they contain the history of the person with whom they were found. He was a descendant of Ham through the loins of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and that he received his kingdom from the ruler of heaven and earth. And if you want, we can just go to the next slide and do both those together. Um, and so the next slide is going to have the answer to question three. It says, uh, the plates were later placed in a museum in St. Louis known as McDowell's, which was afterwards destroyed by fire and the plates were lost. Um, question four was about, would this confirm the Book of Mormon? They said, the event would go very far towards confirming the idea that in very ancient times, there was intercourse between the Eastern and Western hemispheres. And the statement of the prophet would mean that the remains were Egyptian. The fair implication also from the prophet's words is that the descendant of the pharaohs possessed a kingdom in the new world. And this civiliz- and this circumstance may account for the evidence of a dash of Egyptian civilization in our American antiquities. Um, and then fifth, it says the whole account of finding the plates together with the testimony of eight witnesses besides mm. Mr. Wiley, who were acquainted with the finding of the relics, as also the statement from the prophet's history is found in the Millennial Star, volume 21, pages 40 through 44. All right. So, Mike, what's significant if you had to summarize? Uh, just that in a church-published magazine, they're, again, affirming the Kinderhook plates are real. They're affirming that Joseph Smith translated a portion of them. Uh, they're putting a lot of emphasis on the fact that there's eight witnesses to the Kinderhook plates being real, which, as you know, there's eight witnesses, the eight and the three to the Book of Mormon. Um, and just that this is proof of the Book of Mormon having people that came here and had a dash of Egyptian, which would give us the Reformed Egyptians. So they are using the Kinderhook plates in um, 1906 or 1904 to establish the Book of Mormon's authenticity and that Joseph Smith was a prophet who could translate them. And and they're they're not holding back. They're they're going full out to say that this this is what happened. Mm, interesting, Nemo. Anything you want to add as an observation? I had a thought, and it has now escaped me. So we'll see. Oh no, that's back. okay. Yeah, like like already. I'm if if they're using the Kinderhook plates to bolster the credibility of the Book of Abraham and the Book of Mormon, and then later it's all turned out to be bullocks, as Nemo might want to say. <laughs> you know, is it fair to say then then the Book of Mormon then then is up for question as to its validity if things that they provided as evidence to the Book of Mormons or the Book of Abraham's validity ultimately fall? I mean, that to me, that's something that just immediately jumps out. Oh, I remember what I wanted to say. Oh, good. I've stalled I for think you, a good, <laughs> a good um, litmus test for those who are still in the church or, you know, still attend the church would be, if you want to decide whether this was the church really pushing this narrative, the church often includes Enzyme article quotes and Leahona quotes in Sunday school manuals. Imagine yourself in Sunday school, this being presented to you in a Sunday school manual. Now imagine yourself putting up your hand and disagreeing with it. What reaction would you get? Yep. And that reaction will tell you just how sincerely people held this belief. Because if it's been if it's included in the church magazines, if it could be included in a church manual, then to go against that, that feeling you would get will tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And, and that article is not going to be written in the in the improvement era unless there's people talking about it. And they're talking about it because William Fugate said he made it up. And so the church is doubling down and they're putting in their own publications to their members to say, that guy's a liar. This is real. Joseph Smith is a prophet because he translated part of them. I mean, they're not mincing words here. And that's why I think that article is really important because it shows that the church in 1904, after William Fugate said they were a hoax, was doubling down um, instead of maybe, you know, praying to God to ask if they were real or not. They're just going to go straight up and say, nope, they're real because Joseph Smith translated part of them. So I, I, you can't get around that. Like Nemo said, this isn't a church publication. This isn't just some random quote. This is something that was sent to every member so that they could know Joseph Smith was not fooled. All right. Well, let's go ahead and go to the next slide, which is B.H. Roberts converts Joseph's account to the first person. 
Yeah, and so we talked about this earlier in the episode, and this is something that kind of happens um, with the apologetics for this, so I wanted to bring this up, which is in 1930, B.H. Um, Roberts is putting together the history of the church, and what they do is they take these journals um, from Joseph Scribes, and they convert them from third person to first person. And so we mentioned earlier about how the initial uh, entry from William Clayton said, you know, President Joseph translated a portion of them, and so now it says, I have translated a portion of them. And so this really isn't that important. It's just to say that the church itself is going to be the one that is going to change the journals from like a third person to a first person. And it's only important because we'll get into this with the apologetics. But I just want to note that in 1930, the church is going to change this from third person to first person. And the fact that they're including it in the history of the church tells you that they believe that what Joseph Smith translates here is authentic and being done through Joseph Smith as part of his prophetic gift. All right, Nemo, anything you want to add? I just love it when they change the history of these things. And yeah. then, as we're going to get to later, they'll start trying to throw into question um, certain people that write things down of Joseph Smith, while completely ignoring the fact that they will take the words of those scribes and just alter them to suit their purpose. Yep. Yeah, it's it's problematic. All right, yeah. And that's... I don't know. Is that shady or deceptive on B.H. Roberts's part? Like, I tend to want to honor him, especially because of the Shannon Caldwell Montez, you know, secret Mormon meetings in 1922, his conscientious objection to the potential invalidity of the Book of Mormon as a translation, along with pretty clear evidence that by the end of his life, he lost his faith in the history of the Book of Mormon. I tend to want to view B.H. Roberts as more of a white hat than a black hat. Is this evidence of deception or not? Mike? I think it's or evidence Nemo? of clutching at straws. What? I mean, if you read this book, The Man's a Hero, right? Right. Studies of the Book of Mormon by B.H. Roberts, and you start to see, okay, he, he got it, he understood. But at the same time, he's still trying to make these things work. And I, I can't blame him for it, but it is it is deceptive. There's no getting around that. You can't mince words in the same way that they didn't mince words about what, just what they thought these translations were. Okay. Yeah. Mike, anything you I, want I, to add? No, I, I, well, like changing Joseph's scribe's journals from third person to first person doesn't bother me just because I think they're just trying to make it more readable. But we've talked about in previous episodes that they'll change... Um, for example, there's one part where Joseph Smith talks about going to get a beer. Uh, it's like going for a pint at Moser's or something like that. And in the history of the church, they just scrub that out so that members don't realize Joseph Smith was drinking after the word of wisdom because they want members to obey the word of wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's shady. Um, I don't think changing it from the third person to the first person is a huge deal just because I think you're trying to make it more readable for, for members. And the fact is, these scribes are writing it down as Joseph Smith is telling it to him. So it's not like they're writing like from a from a distance and then having it converted into Joseph's words. They're, they're writing down what Joseph's telling them. And then B.H. Roberts is going to say, since they're writing down what Joseph's saying, we're just going to convert it as if Joseph said it himself because it's a lot more meaningful. But I don't find that shady as much I as think, when they change things. I think the reason I find it shady is because of the word games and the games that the... the, the oh, I know John doesn't like the word games, but the what apologists will do and defenders of the faith will do around when they will say, well, this was Joseph Smith's scribe. It wasn't actually oh, yeah. him. So in, in, in that background, to then change the words of Joseph Smith's scribe to the first person as though they are the words of Joseph Smith himself, because we know that they muddy the waters in that area and they will cherry pick in that area anyway, that's why I tend to say that it's shady because it, it's all part of that same process. Yeah. Oh, I agree with that because it's shady the way that the church and apologetics try to use what they know was done uh, commonly in changing it to first person to then say that what what the problems with the church don't really matter because it was it was changed like they know why it was changed they know what was changed but they try to make members think that it was something bigger than that in order to keep them from looking that part is is really dishonest and shady um and i agree with you 100% because they do play games with the fact that they know full and well why bh roberts made the changes he did but they're going to weaponize that to then try to neutralize the problems while still privileging all of the other things that the scribes wrote down that they want us to obey, whether it's DNC 132, any of the revelations. I mean, my goodness, the, you know, scribes wrote down the Book of Mormon, yet we're supposed to believe that's flawless. You know, I mean, it's just you can't have it both ways. And so you either trust Joseph Smith's scribes or you don't. 
and and you cannot just kind of waver between the two. It's like the tight versus loose translation, except it's like good scribe, bad scribe. So it's like, well, Joseph Smith was wrong here, so that scribe went rogue. Joseph Smith hasn't been proven wrong on this, so that's from God. It's, you can't do that. That is super shady. Okay. All right. Let's jump to the next slide. Commentary on the Book of Mormon confirms the Kinderhook plates. Yeah, and so this is a book written in 1961, and it's— um, it's edited and arranged by George Phillips and um, Jane John. Uh, I can't pronounce that word. And I, I know I know it's published. I think it's published through the church. I'm not sure exactly like how this was like distributed, but this is from 1961, and it's written for people who are trying to get more depth to the Book of Mormon. And it says, "But on the other hand, we have the fact before us that the skeleton of the Pharaoh found in Kinderhook, Illinois, referred to previously, was dug out of a large mound. After penetrating about 11 feet, the workers came to a bed of limestone that had been subjected to the action of fire. They removed the stones, which were small and easy to handle, to the depth of two feet more when they found the skeleton. This was evidently a burial chamber, as with the bones, which appeared to have been burned, was found plenty of charcoal and ashes. From the fact, from this fact, it is evident that some of the mounds were, are of very ancient date, as it is not supposable that this man would be the only one of his race and nation to be buried in this manner. We also suggest that this colony of Egyptians may have originated the style of architecture in this country in which so many find resemblances to the Egyptian and which is spe uh, especially characterized by the erection of vast truncated pyramids. And so some of that text earlier we read in one of the other quotes. So obviously this commentary is, is relying on some earlier quotes, but it's just showing that they are using the Kinderhook plates all the way up until this point to try to bolster the Book of Mormon and also cling to the fact that this is true and using it to basically tell us that's why the country is the way it is. And obviously, as we're going to get to, it's completely made up and it just shows how easily fooled um, people are um, when you're trying to defend Joseph Smith and make him a prophet. So one quick question I have, that that's not necessarily, in a, you know, George Reynolds and Jan Sojal, that's not necessarily an official church source, is it? Or is it? Uh, I don't know if it's an official church source or if it's like a book that's published to be like kind of a, you know, you know, they have all those books that you're supposed to buy to, um, to get more depth into like, um, the come following manuals or book of Mormon or general conference talks. Oh, so I'm okay. assuming it's one of those. I don't think it's like being put out by the first presidency, but it is a commentary that's being distributed for people to use, to understand the book of Mormon. So prob so probably probably a Deseret book, right? Okay. Yeah, that that would be that would be my guess what it is. So I'm not saying that this is like a first presidency thing as yeah. much as just saying the mainstream belief of the church in 1961 is that the Kendrick plates are real, Joseph Smith translated a portion of them and that is confirming the Book of Mormon as well as why, you know, there's certain things happening in America such as the mounds which we talked about uh in our Book of Mormon um surrounding influences episode um that he was using the mound builder myth to formulate kind of the the themes of the Book of Mormon. And this is also showing okay. that idea coming back. Okay. Yeah, I just Googled it, and definitely a commentary on the Book of Mormon was published by Deseret Book, according to what I'm looking at. Yeah. And so that's the church imprimatur, if that's the right word. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so this is a. This yeah. is not like coming from the first presidency, but yeah, this is something— got it. The church isn't going to print yeah. something that is off the walls, basically. So Nemo, anything else you want to add? Uh, yeah, there's a sleight of hand at play here. They call him Pharaoh. They call him a yeah. Pharaoh rather than being a descendant of Pharaoh, mm. king of Egypt. And I wonder whether that's because they now know that Pharaoh is a title, not a name. Mm. And so they've, they've shifted that so that it gives more credibility to it. They also now are playing to the um, hemispheric or the the kind of the broad spread Book of Mormon model. Uh, I forget the exact name for it, but they can no longer go for the upstate New York Book of Mormon geography model because yep. in the early 1920s, B.H. Roberts brought a lot of attention to the problems with that. So we're now in the 60s when this is being published. And so the the archaeological digs and all that sort of stuff is also come forward so they've realized they've got to go to a broad continental model um which is why they can now start bringing in you know uh, central american pyramids as evidence mm. of egyptian presence in america fascinating yep all right thanks nemo all right well let's go to the next slide which is the byu archaeological society doubles down so now we're in september of 1962 so obviously we're getting you know further and further away from when William Fugate declared these a hoax. And so the president of the BYU Archaeological Society, Welby W. Ricks, wrote the following in the Improvement Era magazine after one of the Kinderhooks plates was found. And so to 
give a little context. These plates were all believed to have been lost. It's very similar to the Book of Abraham papyrus. Um, and then all of a sudden, the Chicago Historical Society found one of the six plates. And this obviously, just like with the Book of Abraham, they thought, oh my goodness, this is so great. It's going to prove everything is true. And as you find out with, with church history, typically the more you find, the more that it, it goes to show that Joseph Smith was not a prophet. Um, and so they find this plate. And the leader, the president of the Archaeological Society writes in, a, again, a church-produced magazine. It says, a recent discovery of one of the Kinderhook plates, was examined by jo- which was examined by Joseph Smith uh, Jr., reaffirms his prophetic calling and reveals the false statements made by one of the finders. Uh, the find solved a 74-year-old controversy and put the plates back into the category of genuine, which Joseph Smith Jr. had said they were in the first place. What scholars may learn from this ancient record in future years or what may be translated by divine power is an exciting thought to contemplate. This much remains. Joseph Smith Jr. stands as a true prophet and translator of ancient records by divine means and all the world is invited to investigate the truth which has sprung out of the earth, not only of the Kinderhook plates, but of the Book of Mormon as well. And I'll, you know, Nemo, any reaction to that, Nemo? No, not really. Okay. Other than... Yeah. The only thing I'm going to say is tell me if logic, if my logic makes sense here. If they're going to say that the authenticity of the Kinderhook plates um, sort of like bolsters the legitimacy or the credibility of Joseph's prophetic calling, is, is, it, is it consistent or logical that then if the Kinderhook plates are shown to be a fraud, that by, by pure logic alone, that would... Uh, that would challenge or question Joseph's prophetic calling. Come on, John, you know that's not how the game works. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's not how they play that game. But you are right. The logic yeah. absolutely holds. If they're going to use this to bolster the credibility, then those same reasons by which it would bolster that credibility, if it's proven false, would also um, reduce the credibility of the Book of Mormon. Yep. And, and I, I love how much confidence there is in this article because... You know, it's almost like they're spiking the football on people who are saying Joseph Smith made it up. And it just goes to show just again, when we have those blinders on that the church is true um, and we're trying to find ways to defend it. You've got these these claims that are being made, even though they found the plate that doesn't authenticate anything Joseph Smith did. And yet they run to the improvement era to tell members, ha ha, we found a plate. Joseph Smith absolutely translated. He's absolutely a prophet. And this is why. I mean, they literally say um, we... Uh, the truth which has sprung out of the earth, not only of the Kinderhook plates. And they're literally telling you to study the Kinderhook plates because there's a lot of truth coming out of it. <laughs> that's, those are their words. And so it's not only are they saying, yeah, we found one and it shows they're not a hoax. They're like, not only is it a hoax, but it's a freaking masterpiece. And I might sound like I'm coming off too strong. Read these quotes. They are mm-hmm. spiking the football here. And I, I just find that overconfidence just to be so ridiculous because of the fact, as Nemo said, and if you said, John, when you make the, the more you bolster that claim that it's true, the more that when it's proven false that you're you're screwed. And so I just, I'm surprised that they went so hard at this. John, you say that 50% of your audience have never been Mormon, right? And so you uh, take the time to explain some of the Mormon lingo. Absolutely. Jug. Will yeah. one of you please explain to me what on earth spiking the football is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nemo, I forgot. Haven't so, you been watching so, the World uh, Cup, Nemo? Don't yeah. you know what happens? You know, you spike well, the football. It would deflate the ball if you spiked it, surely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so, so Nemo, in, in America, we have football, which is awesome. Uh, I know you have, you have football. Um, and uh, when, you score, when you score a touchdown, you celebrate, and usually you spike the football into the ground as like a, a celebration. Okay. So, yeah, okay. so the phrase is basically saying that they're celebrating a, a score here okay. uh, a little prematurely. So, yeah, in, in this cool. case, it's more like um, there, there's a really fun video of, of a football player, and he's running, and he celebrates too early, and he lets go of the football like at the half-yard line. That's kind of what the church is doing here more so than, than spiking it. But, yeah, it, sorry, Nemo, that, that is an unfair uh, reference for <laughs> That's you. That's all right. Thank you for explaining. Something tells me Nemo was trying to make a joke more than he was trying to who, get who further says, Who says this podcast yeah. isn't informative, huh? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's still fun. Though. Yeah, and but yeah, that, that I, I think that quote is really damning. I know it's from the BYU archa- archaeological president and not from like you know the first presidency, but I think the fact is that they're putting it in a church published magazine and they're going so hard at it that it really makes the bounce back when it's proven false just to be that much stronger than if they had just kind of maybe quietly said we found a plate, mm-hmm. we're you know, conf- it's just they're, they're like going straight into it, and I think that's really 
obviously it proves to be a really bad idea, but I, I just think even at the time, I'm surprised someone wasn't like, maybe take a little bit of your foot off the gas here because we don't really know what these are yet, but but they don't. At the same time, like by the same token, Emerson Ballard will hold up the 1970 um, James B. Allen article from the Improvement Era and say, we were always talking about yeah. multiple accounts of the first vision. So if it's in the Improvement Era, it's like, apostles will use it to defend themselves they'll use it to they will use it to say we as a church were talking about this yep. so you can't get much more clear than if it's in there regardless of who the author is because james b allen was a byu professor he wasn't an apostle regardless of who the author is apostles modern apostles now are saying if it was written in that magazine that was us the church talking about it yep yeah and that's another thing like to your point earlier about cherry picking you can't have it both ways. Mm -hmm. If you're going to cite the improvement era as proof that we were talking about it and being straightforward, you can't then say, well, it's in the improvement era, but you know, it didn't really matter because it was from someone else. I mean, that's that's the, the whole problem mm -hmm. with cherry picking and kind of selectively deciding in in 2022 what we're allowed to talk about from 1970 and what or 1962 or whatever versus today. You, you have to have it both ways. Either the improvement era speaks for the church or it doesn't. Mm -hmm. You got to pick. Yeah. And I'm just going to, you know, I remember... This famous quote from Hugh Nibley, where they were talking about the glass liquor trial and, and Joseph's, you know, peepstone sh shenanigans back when church apologists and Hugh Nibley and everyone else were all claiming that Joseph Smith was never a treasure digger and that he was never, you know, uh, you know, he never faced trial for his shenanigans. I remember that quote, something to the effect of, of Hugh Nibley saying, if this stuff were actually true, it would be the most damning and, you know, the most damning evidence that, that could ever be provided against Joseph Smith. And, I, and, and we're kind of being repetitive here, but it's just really important to note these techniques of church apologists because there's never a, it's just pure motivated reasoning. There's never a point where they're even making an attempt to be fair and objective, because just like with Hugh, Hugh Nibley's claim that you know the the glass liquor trial evidence would then be damning to Joseph Smith, there's never a point where he then circles back and says, "Hey, you know what? I said that before. Now it turns out that Joseph, in fact, was." You know, uh, you know, st did did w was faced from from an actual trial and a judge for a scrying or peeping or doing this folk magic stuff. There's never a point where Hugh Nibley sort of like is called to account and acknowledges that that this does in fact uh, damage Joseph's credibility. The same with these apologists, these Mormon apologists that are that are spiking the football around the Kinderhook plates. I'm, I'm predicting we're never going to see an instance where they circle back and say, yeah, okay, it turns out the Kinderhook plate stuff was false. And, and, um, and so that does challenge Joseph's credibility. I just predict we're never going to see that, you know? No. And, and I'll, I'll, I know we're beating a dead horse here, but like, you know, Every time we do these topics, especially like polygamy um, in the Book of Mormon, like treasure digging and all that, apologists will scream presentism, presentism. You're, you're looking at that through the lens of 2022 and you're viewing 1830s or 40s through that lens. And in this case, they are viewing the Kinderhook plates through 2022 and ignoring what everybody said at the time the Kinderhook plates were and what they were to Joseph Smith. And so, again, it's like what Nemo said. You have, you know, it goes both ways. You can't say presentism to uh, say that Joseph Smith marrying 14-year-old girls was normal, which it wasn't, uh, and then say, oh, but by the way, we're going to view the Kinderhook place through the fact that we now know they're, they're fake and then work backwards. And so, you know, it's just, it just to me, uh, and I, I know, John, you don't like the word games. It just shows that when apologetics play these games where they're just jumping around and it doesn't, there's no logical consistency because it, the only objective is to neutralize these problems. It, and it doesn't matter what problems you create elsewhere. And that's why, as I said earlier in the episode, that's why I think the Kinderhook plates are so amazing because the plates by themselves is one thing, but it, it's what it impacts everywhere else. And that's what we're going to kind of get into soon um, in this episode, because it really does solidify problems elsewhere um, that happen when the apologists make okay. the claims are going to make. And we'll get into all that. Yeah. Just uh, a quick a quick point is that the reason they can do that, the reason that apologists can jump all around and it doesn't have to make any logical sense is because the church, the, the, the key to the social experiment that is the church is that they have taught people to think emotionally, not logically. Yep. And so as long as emotionally it makes you feel good about Joseph Smith and it makes you yep. feel good about your testimony, 
then it doesn't matter if logically it works or not. So that's how they get away with it. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And I mean, I can't tell you, and obviously both of you have probably had more experiences with it than I am, where you start, like someone will, will come up to me and they'll say, you're wrong about this. And I'll say, um, here's some sources where I'm explaining, you know, what I'm saying, this backs it up. And they'll reply with some form of like, this doesn't, this makes me feel like it's coming from Satan or this makes me feel <laughs> uncomfortable and I don't want to read it. And to your point, that is how we're conditioned to think is if we get uncomfortable, we need to get out. And, and so um, apologetics is about, you know, it's almost like a drug. It's like you put that drug, you know, you put the needle in your arm of apologetics, you're like, oh, that feels so good. It doesn't solve anything, but it'll get you through to the next time you need you need a fix. And it really has no need to be consistent or intellectually honest because that's not the goal. Yeah. Um, and obviously we'll talk about more about that as we get, uh, we have an episode all about apologetics later, but yeah, it just shows the Kinderhook Plates is a good example of how apologetics just completely slam the brakes, do a 180, and then just start ramming over all their old uh, old uh, apologetics to, to make sure that it, it erases uh, their history of, of defending these as authentic. Mm-hmm. So all we right. can go to the next okay. one. I think we beat that dead horse. All right. So if 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 the problems weren't enough for the church as as you know, related to the Kinderhook plates. Now we have Apostle Marky Peterson affirming the Kinderhook plates. Yeah, and so now we're in 1979. Uh, we have Mormon Apostle Marky Peterson. He publishes a book called Those Gold Plates, and he offers the following on the Kinderhook plates. He says, There are the Kinderhook plates, too, found in America and now in the possession of the Chicago Historical Society. Controversy has surrounded these plates and their engravings, but most experts agree they are of ancient <laughs> vintage. And so it just shows like 1979, that's not that long ago, an apostle for the church is writing in a book that they are authentic and that Joseph Smith prophet, you know, and so 1979, just keep that in mind because we're about to see the turn here. Oh, and, man. and and for our non-Mormon listeners, we just have to reemphasize the point that Mormons are taught that they're all of all of their first presidency in Quorum of the Twelve, those fifteen men, they're sworn in, they're sustained as prophets, seers, and revelators, and as special witnesses of Christ. That's what we're all led to believe. That's how we sustain them. That's how they sell themselves to us. And so there's a, it's not just some guy. This is a guy that's supposedly talking to Jesus. That we we give him that respect and power. Um, and and that's why it's especially problematic when apostles are uh, are are publishing this stuff. Nemo, anything you want to add? Yeah, the, that that line about like most experts agree they are of ancient vintage is very much a ninety percent of dentists agree. <laughs> yeah. And you look at the figures, and it's like we asked three dentists, and like yeah. you know you know what I mean? it's yeah. it's ridiculous it's- that he's going to make such an outlandish claim. No one's going to pick him up on it. No one's going to say, okay, which experts can I see the papers they wrote? Can I like define an expert? Because if he's talking about Hugh Nibley, which he probably is, then I would argue that he's not necessarily an expert in the true sort of um, unbiased sense of the word. Well, yeah. And that, and it'll also, the, the very next slide is going to show you what the value of the church's experts are, because in the very next slide, we're going to see that those experts who agreed they were anciently vintage, we're wrong. So yeah. in a lot of ways, it's almost worse that he says that because he's basically <laughs> saying all of the experts I rely on have no idea what they're doing, you know? And so that just shows, you know, just as we talk about the book of Abraham, we got John Gee and Carrie Molstein who are putting these theories out and they're so easily falsified uh, just by looking at the documents. Uh, right. and, and the same thing here, the church is like, no, no, the experts agree. Then you find out they're wrong and it's like, oh, that's awkward. But, you know, again, it's all right. For most members are not going to know. All right, let's jump to the next slide. Science proves the Kinderhook plates are indeed a hoax. Yep. So 1980 now, the next year after the Mark E. Peterson quote, the Chicago Historical Society, who possesses the one plate, uh, they commenced on testing the plate in order to understand its origins and thus proved once and for all it was a 19th century creation. Uh, and this leads to the August uh, 1981 Enzyme article, which finally concedes the Kinderhook plates are a hoax after scientific testing determines that Fugate's story of creating the hoax was actually correct. And so the enzyme says, as a result of these tests, we concluded that the plate owned by the Chicago Historical Society is not of ancient origin. 
we concluded that the plate was etched with acid, and as Paul Chessman and other scholars have pointed out, ancient inhabitants would have probably have engraved the plates rather than etched them with acid. Secondly, we concluded that the plate was made from a true brass alloy, uh, copper and zinc, typical of the mid-19th century, whereas the brass of ancient times was actually bronze, an alloy of copper and tin. Furthermore, one would expect an ancient alloy to contain larger amounts of impurities and in inclusions than did the alloy tested. And so they're just straight up saying, like, yeah, science is telling us there's no way and, these are ancient. And I'm going to guess that, that the Tanners probably uh, published, um, you know, first that these Kinderhook plates were shown to be a fraud. I was going to ask if you knew that. I don't know it for sure, but that's what my memory, you know, I was just watching a short, you know, we've been releasing video shorts from all our Mormon Stories podcast interviews, and I was just watching one from Sandra Tanner that was released recently, where she basically said that over the 30 plus years that her and Gerald were publishing stuff, there was always this pattern of Gerald and Sandra Tanner first publishing a super problematic event related to Mormon church truth claims. And then miraculously the Mormon church, you know, six months or a year later would, would publish the same thing, giving no credit to the Tanners, but then acting how, you know, none of this was a problem to begin with. Yeah. I can't, I can't tell from a quick Google search when the Tanners published about it, but I mean, obviously they have, I just don't know if it was in between when the testing was done or not. Yeah. And I'm I just mean, wondering, go ahead, go ahead, Nemo. I was going to say, regardless, it's, it's a case of this is about as close as you'll get to the church saying, oh, yeah, we got it wrong. But they won't say they got it wrong. They're just stating the scientific fact. Yeah. Because they can't be seen to not acknowledge it. Right. Yeah, because the, the you know, I was raised Mormon 45 years in the church. I know what the Mormon church taught me and, and fellow members about what honesty is. You know, we all know the steps of repentance are, you know, acknowledge the sin confess the sin, make restitution for the sin, and then never commit the sin again. So if the Mormon, you know, if the Mormon church from Joseph Smith and, you know, William Clayton and Parley Pratt and B.H. Roberts and, you know, you know, all the way up to uh, um, Apostle Marky e. Peterson, if they got it wrong, if they systematically misled the Mormon people for a century and a half or more, the honest thing to do, according to the Mormon church's own standards of truth, would be not just to say, hey, these plates were proven to be false. They would say, hey, these plates have been proven to be false. We've been misleading you for 150 years. And by the way, we attached... Um, you know, our testimony of the Kinderhook plates to the authenticity or the veracity or to the credibility of Joseph Smith's translation. And now all this has been shown to be false. And so that calls into question Joseph Smith's veracity as a translator. I'm guessing that did not appear in the August 1981 Ensign um, article. Is that fair to say, Mike? It's fair. And actually, why don't you go to the next slide? Because that's a perfect transition <laughs> to what they actually do say in that article. All right, let's read it. So in the same article, they say, A recent electronic and chemical analysis of a metal plate, one of the six original plates, brought in 1843 to the Prophet Joseph Smith in Nauvoo, Illinois, appears to solve a previously unanswered question in church history, helping to further evidence that the plate is what its producers later said it was, a 19th century attempt to lure Joseph Smith into making a translation of ancient-looking characters that had been etched into the plates. Then they say, Joseph Smith did not make the hoped-for translation. In fact, no evidence exists that he manifested any further interest in the plates after early examination of them, although some members of the church hope that they would prove to be, <laughs> they would prove to be significant. So they're basically immediately saying, uh, you know what, they're fake, and it's kind of funny because Joseph never tried to do it anyways, which is completely at odds with what they used to say. And so I agree that there's no evidence that Joseph had interest in the plates beyond the partial translation, because we have no quotes of them one way or the other um, after that. Um, but the apologetic is just so disingenuous and is completely rewriting the history of the church, which we just spent the last, what, 30, 40 minutes doing. Um, they thought this event was so valuable that they defended the partial translation for 140 years. They defended it for a good um, 100 years after William Fugate said it was a, a hoax. They included it in the history of the church. And so all you have to do is, is reread the timeline just to know how ridiculous this instantaneous flip on the Kinderhook plates is. Nemo, what do you want to add? It's just if you if you would 
doing a 180 this quickly in a car you'd get whiplash it's yeah. it's crazy just how quickly they turned and just how quickly like you said they start to remove joseph and try and protect it's like they try and protect joseph from the implications of this story by by trying to give him some distance that just doesn't actually exist in the historical record the trick the church missed the thing that they should have worked out right near the beginning that joseph smith should have given them an example of is how to give a sure spiritual witness of something being true and then what to do when that thing is proven to not be true that that is something the church needs to survive and it doesn't have it no no, yeah. Right now, their answer is, oh, go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say that, like, this is, for me, this is smoking gun material regarding fraud. Like, what I'm always looking for, you know, there, people are always going to believe strange things without evidence. It's just baked into the human experience. And you were never going to stamp out people wanting to exercise faith, to believe there's an afterlife, to believe that there's meaning and purpose in the world, to believe that there's a God. But what I am always on the lookout for are like these moments in Mormon church history where like knowing fraud is committed. And, you know, whether it's the, 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 the revelation of the book of Abraham in the New York Times as being problematic, the, the, the facsimiles in, you know, 1912 or whenever that was, the, the secret Mormon meetings uh, of 1922 when B.H. Roberts put the general authorities on notice – uh, that that the Book of Mormon was deeply problematic from a historical perspective, whether it's the excommunication of Fon Brody, whether it's Joseph Fielding Smith yanking, you know, the 1832 First Vision account out of, you know, Joseph Smith's own journal. There are these moments in Mormon church history where the church knew that it had his hand in the cookie jar, where it knew that that the account that the church was teaching its members in the world was not true. This seems to be now 1981, yet another instance where the church, you know, morally had an obligation to say, we screwed up, we got it wrong, we miseducated everyone, we taught things that weren't true. And instead, like you said, whiplash, they completely fail to be honest and they and they gas and they instead gaslight the world and basically say, Yeah, this proves what we were saying all along. Right? Do I have that wrong? No, no. I mean that's just it. It's like, you know, it kind of reminds me like you're a you're a salesperson and you've been trying for six months to land this account. And after six months, the the place you're trying to get, they go with someone else and you walk out the door and you're like, I didn't want that anyways. It, that's what it feels like. They're they spent a hundred plus years telling us that this was a proof of him being a prophet. And then the second science forces them to admit it's a hoax. So like well, he didn't try anyways. It's just so bad. And it's one of those things where you, to your point, they should just be like, yeah, he made a partial translation. We don't know the means of it, but he did show an interest. Um, but we don't know why he didn't do any further, but instead they just try to play this game where it's like, well, he didn't really, well, he didn't really do anything with it anyways. And that's incomplete Mike, because they would also need to say, and multiple apostles, and church historians oh, yeah. for over a century and a half bolstered this claim, which which in, in church publications, which now turns out to be false. And Joseph Smith himself bolstered it, which now, you know, um, turns out to be false. And so Joseph and a bunch of prophets, scissors, and revelators all got it wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just okay. bad. And it's one of those things How? where you don't need to say it, but, yeah. you know. How do you say to a group of people... Everyone that we taught you to believe was being truthful, honest, and speaking for a deity was wrong. Yeah. How do, how do you sell that to a group of people? You can't. That's what we talked about last the episode about Book of Abraham, where it's like, can you decanonize the Book of Abraham? It's like, no, because the moment you do that, you're signaling to the membership <laughs> of the church, Joseph Smith got it wrong. So the moment you realize even the church is willing to say, yeah, Joseph Smith could not translate the language he claimed to be able to translate, then to Nemo's point, it's gone because everything else crumbles. And so then if you say uh, our prophets, seers, and revelators through the church publications also can't tell discern between fact and fiction, why in the world am I going to believe Russell Nelson when he's already been wrong on a lot of stuff himself? So it, it just goes you, – you immediately will start seeing that Russell Nelson and Dallin Oaks, they've all been wrong on big issues in their lifetimes – and then if you realize they have no power of discernment, why are we following them? And, and so the church requires a lot out of us. And so they cannot 
be seen as infallible. They'll say past prophets were fallible, but they're not going to say, yeah, Russell Nelson is going to only get maybe 40% of what he says correct. They're just going to say, Russell Nelson's not a perfect person, but you better obey what he says. And so yeah. it, you you have to maintain that. It's the whole problem with a structure that's built on charismatic leadership is that the moment you don't trust that they know what they're doing, it's over. Yeah. So uh, this next slide is entitled Questioning William Clayton's Journal. And I'm guessing this begins an analysis of Mormon church apologetics, yep. you know, regarding how they, they sort of backtrack. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah. So now we're going to kind of transition into the apologetics part okay. of this episode. All right. So now we're going it's, to questioning William Clayton's journal. Yep. And so now remember, as we've already talked about, they, they've defended this translation for 140 years, def- saying it's proof of him being a prophet. And so the same uh, Ensign article in 1981 is now going to say the following. Although this account appears to be the writing of Joseph Smith, it is actually an excerpt from a journal of William Clayton. It has been well known that the serialized history of Joseph Smith consists largely of items from other persons, personal journals and other sources collected during Joseph Smith's lifetime and continued after the saints were in Utah, then edited and pieced together to form a history of the prophet's life in his own words. It was not uncommon in the 19th century for biographers to put the narrative in the first person when compiling a biographical work, even though the subject of the biography did not actually say or write all the words attributed to him. Thus, the narrative would represent a faithful report of what others felt would be helpful to print. The Clayton Journal excerpt was one item used this way. For example, the words, I have translated a portion, originally read, President J has translated a portion. And, you know, let's just go to the next slide because the two slides work together. Okay. And so, um, and then the article continues, where the ideas written by William Clayton originated is unknown. I want to repeat that again. The Enzyme article, which is published by the church, is going to say where the ideas written by William Clayton originated is unknown. Uh, However, as it will be pointed out later, speculation about the plates and their possible content was apparently quite unrestrained in Nauvoo when the plates first appeared. In any case, this altered version of the extract from William Clayton's journal was reprinted in the Millennial Star of 15th of January, 1859, and unfortunately, was finally carried over into the original church history uh, when the history of Joseph Smith was edited into book form as a history of the church in 1909. William Clayton evidently had access to the plates at some point, for in his journal entry on Monday, May 1st, he included a tracing of one of the plates. Whether or not he was present when Joseph Smith saw the plates is unknown. Two days later, on Wednesday, Brigham Young also drew an outline of one of the Kinderhook plates in a small notebook slash diary that he kept. Inside the drawing, he wrote, May three, May 3rd, 1843, I had this at Joseph Smith's house found near Quincy. So, Nemo, what's your thoughts to the quote, uh, where the ideas written by William Clayton originated is unknown? <laughs> <laughs> they know exactly where that originated. Um, it's good old Mr. Roberts. So, uh, No, we, well, we demonstrated that Joseph Smith, it came yeah. from Joseph Smith, right? We've demonstrated yes, that this today. Is, yeah. yeah, this is what I was talking about earlier, is that when they start to muddy the waters about who wrote it, and so was it Joseph Smith's ideas, or was it just his scribe going rogue, it creates these sorts of problems but it does show the other thing the church is willing to do is throw previous people doing secular things like compiling a history under the bus they're willing to admit technical errors as long as they don't implicate the prophets seers and revelators in their prophetic fallibility yeah yep or infallibility. We're, we're stealing the thunder from the next slide but i i just want to say you know, water. The problem with Watergate wasn't just the break-in. This is a U.S. you know reference, political reference to the Nixon I know this one. Watergate scandal. <laughs> yeah, the problem with Watergate wasn't so much the break-in; it, it, it was the cover-up. And this just feels like a cover-up to me, um, mm-hmm. a very significant one. So, so Mike, why don't we just go to the next slide? Yeah, no, and like you said, the the idea that it's unknown where Clayton got Joseph's parcel translation is just it's ridiculous. Um, William Clayton was Joseph's personal scribe, and he was with Joseph Smith on the day that they were introduced to the Kinderhook plates. And we know that Clayton was with Joseph Smith because not only was he at Joseph's home, he officiated a marriage that same day between 37-year-old Joseph Smith and his 17-year-old polygamous wife, Lucy Walker. Ouch. Uh, We covered her story in a previous episode that I highly recommend if you have not listened to that you do because Lucy Walker's story is horrific. But the fact is, 
William Clayton was there when Joseph Smith married Lucy Walker. Uh, so he was with him that day. This idea that, that he was not there or they don't know where it originated from is ridiculous. And so, you know, the bottom line is William Clayton was one of Joseph's most trusted men in the Nauvoo era. And that Clayton was with Joseph during the day and officiated one of his polygamous marriages is further proof of how trusted William Clayton was. And so everyone in the church lauded the Kinderhook plates until they were proven to be a fraud. And so blaming Clayton's journal as being incorrect just seems it, it's it's just beyond dishonest. And so when you want to talk about, you know, lying to your members or, um, you know, this wouldn't pass their own definition of, of honesty. This is just mm. straight up making crap up to try to privilege the image of Joseph Smith. And, and that's. There's there's no way if you're going to – and I would also like if maybe in that Enzyme article they had said, we don't know where William Clayton's uh, ideas originated from, but he was there when Joseph married a 17-year-old girl earlier in the day. I mean <laughs> they're completely leaving that out, and there's a good reason, but it's just – don't give a partial picture and then pretend you don't know because they know a lot more than they tell than they're telling the members. And the other, I, yeah, go ahead. So the other thing they won't tell you is that he was interested, for example, to tr- to write down as a scribe DNC 124 and DNC 125. He wrote both of those sections down. So if you're going to start questioning his ability yep. to write things down accurately that Joseph Smith tells him, we then have to start examining very closely just how true sections of Doctrine and Covenants are. Yeah, yeah that's the thing. You cannot say that William Clayton is making crap up in his journal and then say, oh, but obey those revelations that he, he transcribed for mm-hmm. Joseph Smith. You can't do that. I think he also wrote DNC 132, right? I think uh, it's William yeah. Clayton. So, yeah. I mean, it's like, you know... It's, and, and Which the church would rather forget. I, I, they would rather forget, <laughs> obviously, just for the same reason they're not going to mention that he, he married uh, Lucy Walker in the morning after telling her if she didn't uh, marry him that the gates would be closed forever against her after her... Well, you, you can watch the episode for that story. But yeah, it just shows that they're willing to throw anyone under the bus. But to Nemo's point, you can't do this with William Clayton unless you're also going to throw out everything else he produced for Joseph Smith, and they're not going to do that. And so if you're not willing to do that, then you cannot question his journal entry here because it goes against everything we know. And it's just, it's so badly dishonest that they would do this. And they're only doing it because science finally put them in a position where they can't defend it anymore. And, and tell me if I'm wrong, Mike and Nemo, but my understanding is of all the documents that the Joseph Smith Papers Project uh, and the church, church archives of the LDS Church Archives had been willing to now release, William Clayton's journals are, are you know, one, one example of documents that the Mormon Church has yet to release. It's one of those like final holdouts of potential yeah. scandalous documents that are mm-hmm. so problematic the church is still not, as of 2022, been willing to release them publicly. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, I, I think a lot of them have leaked out over the years, but but obviously they have not published them in a formal setting, which, of course, I think a lot of people are excited to see what's in them. But yeah, they're they're not out there yet. Okay. Yeah. And, and so the, what the church has done with things like Wilford Woodruff's journal that are problematic is they've just censored it. So if you look at Wilford Woodruff's journal on the church's website, you'll see big, thick black marks covering Redacted. it when he mentions of the second anointing. So they've tried that, but I don't think you could publish William Clayton's journal because it would all just be covered in black marks. It'd be like yeah. a redacted mission statement from like some spec op soldiers or something. Yeah. It just, you, it, unreadable. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a reason like, you know, again, if, if they really wanted to be honest here, they would publish the whole day of William Clayton's journal and then say, this is what he said that day. We don't know where it came from, but again, they can't because they don't want to get into the fact that he was trusted enough to be mm-hmm. marrying Joseph to Lucy Walker that same day and then pretend that he wasn't with him later. It's just so it's bad. All right. Well, uh, our loyal viewers will know that we talked about the Gale or the grammar, uh, in Egyptian language, um, grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language set of documents or, uh, you know, uh, from the Book of Abraham episode. So let's talk about now the connections between the Kinderic plates and the Gale. Yeah, and this is one of the coolest um, kind of things that people don't typically talk about with the Kinderhook plates. And so this is directly from Fair Mormon. They say, Joseph Smith, and they put in quotes, translated a portion of those plates, not by claiming inspiration, but by comparing characters on the plates to those on his grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language, the Gale. Um, the Gale was composed in Kirtland about the time of the translation of the Book of Abraham. We'll get into that in a second. Um, they, then they say, Joseph found one of the most prominent characters on the plates to match a character on the second page of the characters in the Gale. Both were boat-shaped. 
The Gale interpretation of this boat-shaped character included everything that William Clayton said Joseph said. And so if you're watching this, you could see it. If you're listening, there's a, a the top figure is from the Kinderhook plates. It's a boat with some extra lines. And then the bottom one is from the Egyptian papyrus. And it's just like, almost looks like a, a mouth with no teeth. And so it's a boat shape with like nothing inside. So they're not really that similar, but they are the same outer shape. And so this th this slide is significant. Why, Mike? Uh, let's just go to the next slide because that, that'll okay. go over it. Because th okay. this is, to me, this is one of the, this is a huge one. And so uh, John Gee, we talked about him a lot in the episodes on the apologetics. He is one of the most well-known Egyptian scholars that's employed by the, the Mormon church. And he follows Hugh Nibley's argument that the Gale was effectively reverse engineered by the scribes. And so what they are trying to say is that the entirety of the book Abraham was written in 1835 on the manuscript pages. And then the scribes later went back and then attempted to match up the symbols from the Egyptian papyri to the alphabet on their own and without Joseph Smith because the translations are completely wrong. And so John Gee needs the Gale to be written um, after the book of Abraham because the Gale is complete gibberish um, because if it's written um, in the in between, it shows that Joseph Smith was part of the Gale and could not translate Egyptian. And so Guy and Nibley make this argument because the only other approach and the one we talked about in where the evidence points is that Joseph Smith couldn't translate Egyptian um, and that we do have the extant papyrus fragment that the book of Abraham, at least the early part, was translated from. We covered this in our previous episodes. We're not going to go over to that into detail. But the reason this is important is that the apologetics about the Kinderhook plates are saying that Joseph Smith got the Kinderhook plates and compared them to the Gale to match a corresponding symbol. And, and it does match up. So fair is correct that most of the points line up. But the problem is this means that John Gee's assertion that the scribes reverse engineered the symbols is completely contradicted by the evidence. And the Kinderhook plates actually kills off the missing scroll theory uh, before it even begins, because Joseph Smith believes that the Gale is authentic and that he is the one that produced it, meaning the scribes couldn't have reverse engineered it, or else why would Joseph Smith be referring to it? Wow, that's kind of intense, mm -hmm. but uh, it's compelling. Nemo, what do you think? Well, I remember when I, many, many moons ago, when I tried to take on the This Is The Show videos that Kwaku put together, they did one about the Kinderhook plates. Yeah. Um, and they had a woman dressed up in an outfit as though she was the Kinderhook plates with a terrible accent. Um, horrible. And they were, they, were trying to in, they were trying to imply that because Joseph Smith looked at the grammar and alphabet of the Egyptian language and compared the, um, the symbols, that meant that he wasn't attempting a divine translation. But they use that in the same breath to try and say that he wasn't trying to translate them at all, which you can't do, you can't say. Even if it wasn't a divine translation like the Book of Mormon or the Book of Abraham, as he claimed, he was still attempting a secular translation. So he still attempted to translate them. So when they try and tell you that he didn't try and translate them at all and he just had a brief glance at them, their own apologetics prove that point, that he still tried to translate them. Yeah. Yeah. You can't get around it anymore, and that's nope. and that's the problem. You just you cannot escape the fact that Joseph Smith believed in the Gale enough to where he referenced to it. Mm -hmm. So even if he's not trying to divinely translate the Kinderhook plates, he is the person who produces the Gale. And if the Gale's yep. wrong, that means Joseph Smith cannot translate. It also means the missing scroll theory for the Book of Abraham is gone. You cannot use it. Mm -hmm. Wow! All right, that's great. Mike. the breaks. Yeah, that's that. It's that's that's just how it goes. <laughs> All right, and, um, well, let's so go. We, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go Nemo. ahead. Sorry, I was going to say. Not me. Oh, okay. okay we're good. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right, so the, so the next slide is the Kinderhook plates cement Joseph Smith's incorrect translations. Yeah, and so, again, if the scribes reverse engineered the Gale as apologists in the Mormon church want you to believe, Joseph Smith would have looked at the Gale, said, what the crap is this, realized somebody was writing uh, translations in his name, and then he would have either fixed the Gale himself not made the translation of William Clayton at all, and they probably would have had some really interesting conversations with the scribes who were screwing around with his Egyptian translations. Like, the fact that he's referring to the Gale and has no problem with it tells you Joseph Smith is the one who authored and approves of the Gale. And so it's a long way of saying that this sample of translation from Joseph Smith on the Kinderhook plates further shows that he's responsible for the symbols and translations on the Gale, which tells us that Joseph Smith not only could not translate Egyptian, but that, as I mentioned earlier, we have the extant papyrus fragment from the book of Abraham, as we discussed in the book of uh, Abraham episodes. And, and so this is one of those areas where when you try to use apologetics to cover one problem, and in this case, they're using the Gale to try to cover up the Kinderhook plate, they're ultimately blowing up any chance of the missing scroll or catalyst theory uh, for the book of Abraham. And, and so 
you have to evaluate these problems in totality because of the fact that now we can look at the Kendrick plates and say, maybe they're not on their own, the smoking gun, but it tells you without any question that the book of Abraham translation was wrong and that we have the, the symbols and that Joseph Smith couldn't do it. And so that's why the Kendrick plates become so important because they tie into the book of Abraham in really big ways. And I'm going to ask you a question I don't think you probably know the answer to, but in this slide that says Fair Mormon, you know, the Joseph Smith translated portion of the plates, um, but compared the characters on the plates to those on the gale. What's the source for that? I mean, I guess it's it's there are, sufficient there are to say for that. What's that? There is a quote, and I don't know if I have it in here. Or yeah, not, I didn't expect you to have a, it. You're basically might, saying that if Fair Mormon, here. if Fair Mormon makes that claim, then the, then the sources, you know, need need to be viewed as legitimate. Is that what you're saying? I think the source is legitimate. I think what the source says, and I don't know if it's in these final slides or not, but the source basically says that Joseph Smith got the plates and compared them to the Egyptian papyrus. And so yeah. there is a source saying I, that he did do that. And so that's a legitimate source. It's just the fact that he's doing that tells you that he believes the Gale is his own production, not some like yeah. secret project done by the scribes. And so Fair Mormon's right to use that source. They're not using a bad source. It's just that by using that source, they're creating problems elsewhere that they're probably not right. realizing at the time. Nemo? I'm shocked at this point if anyone's expecting church apologetics to be internally logically consistent. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I can say. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide. Why didn't Joseph Smith translate the rest of the Kinderhook plates? It's a good question. Yeah, so we talked about yeah, we talked about this earlier a little bit, but you know, a lot of people will say, you know, why didn't Joseph translate more of the Kinderhook plates? And I would argue the main reason is likely that he suspected the plates were not real, but lacked the power of discernment to confirm it from God. And um, as we talked about, Joseph Smith's prophetic powers only work when he is in complete control of the situation. And in this case, he did not have any control over the situation of the Kinderhook plates. And so um, in a, later, a letter dated um, April 8th, 1878, Wilbert Fugate recalled, we understood Joe Smith said the plates would make a book of 1,200 pages, but he would not agree to translate them until they were sent to antiquarian society at Philadelphia, France, and England. And... I don't think, I bet you that quote is real because I think Joseph Smith there is realizing that by the time you sent it to all three of those antiquarian societies, it would take probably months, if not years. And that gets it off of his plate. And it also allows someone else to tell him these are real before Joseph Smith jumps full in. Um, Joseph Smith was also very busy at this point. So it's hard to imagine that he would have the time or need to create new scripture. And in, in, at the you know middle of 1843, he's tied up in dozens of marriages He's on the run from the law. He's a you know he's parading around with his general, and and the last point is keep in mind that it took Joseph Smith eight years to, to write the Book of Abraham, which had just been released around the time the Kinderhook plates were discovered. So if it takes him eight years to do the Book of Abraham, the idea that he would have been able to translate the entirety of the Kinderhook plates in those few months um, after is just absurd, anyways. And so I think that Joseph Smith started to realize that he was up against something that he was very skeptical of and was trying to buy time by telling him to send it off to antiquarian societies. Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to offer either a competing or a supplemental theory to yours. In addition to Joseph being super busy by 1843, 1844, he was killed by 1844. And I mean, you could argue that he was super busy getting cast out of Missouri. You know, the, you know, why didn't he, why did it take him another several years to finish his translation of the Book of Abraham between the mid 1830s and the you know the early 1840s? He was also very busy getting kicked out of Kirtland, getting kicked out of Missouri, and then reestablishing him and his people in Nauvoo. And so there's a there's a decent argument to say that if he had lived, if Joseph had lived until 1850 or 1855, yeah, he would have gotten kicked out of Nauvoo. Maybe he would have reestablished in Texas. Maybe he would have reestablished in Utah. But the, you know, there there might have been enough hubbub of people uh, saying, "Hey, whatever happened to those Kinderic plates? And why didn't you finish that translation?" That if he had he had been able to resurface yet again, he might have finished the translation. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, and that's the thing. We'll never know. I mean, I just yeah. I think the fact that it took him eight years to do the Kinderhook, uh, the Book of Abraham, tells you that between the time that they were found and his death, there was no way it was going to get done. But to your point, he would have needed a period of of basically like some peace where he had time to do it. And the Book of Abraham, especially that Nauvoo portion, is heavily used as a vehicle for the his evolution on the priesthood. 
I don't know what he would have used the Kinderhook plates for to to have you know kind of push a new kind of idea into because he liked to use those scriptures, those revelations, the book of Abraham to push new theology, new ideas he had. Yeah, I, you know, he probably would have at some point if if he had lived long enough. But at the same time. I also, I really do think that at some point he's like, you see someone doing the same tricks you've been doing and you're just like, I know what you're doing, but I can't say it because it also implicates myself. So I I do feel like there had to have been some element of him going, I am stuck here with a lot of people who think I could do this. And then knowing himself that this is probably someone doing the same crap he was doing. Yeah. Nemo, anything you want to add? Uh, I've got a little replica a 1830 Book of Mormon here. 500 odd pages, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. 12, 1200 pages. Is that is that what he said in that quote? 1200 pages from six bell shaped plates. Yeah. And, and that's hard too, because that's from William Fugate. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it does indicate that at least on some level, he was telling people it was going to be a pretty long story off the, just that small amount of plates. Which is just, it shows again his deep misunderstanding of oh, yeah. how engraving on plates work, on how pictographic languages work, uh, which we went over that in, in earlier episodes. And I would encourage people to go back and watch that in our, um, I don't know, was it composition of the Book of Mormon? Well, the gold plates one, we talked about the, the Piergy tablets and how mm-hmm. that compares. And I think that's a good way to look at it to show the symbols on the Piergy tablets was 200 words on three plates. So, this is a six two-sided plates. So you've got 12 plates. You're probably talking, you know, 1,000, 2,000 words total. Obviously, no, nowhere near 1,200. You're not even going to get, you know, a couple, you're not even going to get 100 pages, let alone, you know, 1,200. So, yeah, it just shows he had no idea of how symbols translated to actual language, at least to our language. All right. All right. Well, let's go to the next slide. We're, we're, uh, we're coming to the important conclusion but the next slide is the Kinderick plates exposed Joseph Smith's lack of discernment. Yeah. And so as I've been kind of talking about in this episode, his prophetic abilities were severely impacted if he did not control the situation. And that was the case of treasure digging. It's also the case of the lost 116 pages. And, and I highly recommend if you haven't listened to our lost 116 pages episode, uh, you do that because this is a lot of those same elements. And so in this case, Joseph Smith can see these diggers using treasure digging techniques. They talk about, Uh, a vision in a dream three nights in a row, um, planting the plates overnight before the dig resumed. I I do believe on some level he probably likely suspected the results given that they mirrored some of the claims of the Book of Mormon plates that Joseph Smith would have have known never existed in the way he portrayed it with Reformed Egyptian and all that. Um, But Joseph Smith would have encountered massive risks by declaring the plates fake. He was truly in the most delicate spot and appears at least from the quote from Weber Fugate, in a very careful manner, which is to give a partial translation, but then to tell him, I need to have this verified by three different antiquarian societies. And this is similar to how Joseph Smith was so careful when he was replacing the, the text of the lost 116 pages. And the point here is that Joseph Smith could not get a revelation from God if these plates were real or fake. And yet he was able to describe a random set of bones as Zelf the white Lamanite uh, via claimed revelation uh, during the Zion's camp expedition. Uh, and that was when he was in control of the situation because it was just bones nobody could know. And that's a pattern that we've tried to point out in these episodes where Joseph Smith is able to produce revelation whenever he needs to, as long as he's in control of what's happening. The moment he loses control, those revelations, the discernment, it's just immediately gone. Yeah, I'm going to add not only, you know, does this, does, does the Kinderick plates expose Joseph Smith's lack of discernment, as we've already talked about in this episode? It also condemns, you know, William Clayton, John Taylor, Brigham Young, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, Marky e. Peterson, B.H. Roberts, and like well over half dozen, if not a dozen, of other prophets, seers, and revelators that the Mormon church, you know, would have sustained. You know, it condemns a lot more than just Joseph Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Nemo? Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone that put their trust in him, he's kind of made a fool of, and it shows that they weren't able to tell when he was. If, if you're approaching from a believing perspective, you can't tell when Joseph Smith was speaking for God and when he was just making stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the next slide is Joseph Smith got yet another chance to prove himself a prophet. Yeah, and so we're going to look at this in some more detail, and uh, we've got some future episodes coming up on like revelations and stuff. But Joseph Smith has already received a good number of chances to prove he was a prophet of God, 
in every situation, he has either punted when given the opportunity or been proven a, a failed prophet or, you know, a liar or however you want to frame it. Uh, when Joseph Smith had to replace the lost 116 pages of the Book of Mormon, he refused to retranslate the original material and instead claimed a completely new set of plates to make sure that he couldn't be exposed for not being able to produce a retranslation in the same way. And I realize from a believing perspective, you're going to say, no, God told him to do that. But I'm saying that the actions here were to completely skirt redoing the, the exact text because he knew he couldn't do it. Uh, the word of wisdom lacked any knowledge beyond the 1830s, which could have saved a lot of lives if God had just told Joseph Smith to boil their water, including a bunch of early church members. Um, Joseph Smith translated the book of Abraham Papyri, which was the perfect chance to prove himself a prophet, and yet he got the translation completely wrong. And then when the Kinderhook plates were presented to Joseph, how cool would it have been if he had exposed the hoaxers and told them what they had done? But instead, he lacked any power of discernment to know they were fake, so he gave a partial translation so that he didn't look like he couldn't translate them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. B.H. Robert wants to talk about like what he would have done. You know, B.H. Roberts is like, oh, how come this hoaxer didn't admit to it earlier? How come he didn't do this? Yeah. How come he didn't do that? A more salient question, how come Joseph Smith didn't expose the hoax yeah. at the time? Why did it yep. take scientists years, like, years and years and years later to work it out? Yeah, that's just it. It's like, how many chances do you do you need for Joseph Smith to get it wrong before you just go, yeah, he didn't know what he was doing? And and then if you really want to do it from a believing standpoint, it's like, why is God setting his, his prophet up to look like a fraud over and over again? Um, and I know from a believing standpoint, you'll say, if Joseph Smith told the, the Kinderhook Plates people that they were hoaxers, there'd be no need for faith because we would know he's a prophet. And it's like, I don't, I, I, I don't know if they even understand how ridiculous that, that concept is to say that God wants Joseph Smith to look like a failure to embolden faith in his members. It's just, if that's really what the Mormon version of God is doing, the Mormon version of God is a really bad manager at trying to, to save people. He's actually trying to screw people over because of the fact that he's making Joseph Smith out to look like a fraud over and over. And at some point, you know, if, if you look at that logic, the same you would look at any other person, other religion, other organization— you would never give them that much space because this is enough times to know they have no idea what they're doing. And and yet in the Mormon church, they're going to keep telling you that Joseph Smith actually did get it right if you just look at it in a completely different way. And then I'm just going to reiterate kind of how I started. If you've now followed us kind of 33 episodes into the LDS Discussions series, we've given a credible evidence and reasoning that the Book of Mormon is a failed translation, that the Book of Moses is a failed translation, that the Book of Abraham is a failed translation, that the Doctrine and Covenants are demonstrably, demonstrably problematic translations, and that Joseph Smith's translation of uh, the... Um, you know, the King James Bible is deeply problematic. So that's five out of five failed translations. And and it, then if you had Kinderic Plates, that's six out of six failed translations with zero successful translations. Did, did, am I overreaching, Mike or Nemo? No. 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 If I was I hiring a translator, wouldn't hire him <laughs> yeah. based on his resume. That's just, I mean... This is why, you know, when we talk about, uh, there's a line from the CS letter, I think it says something like, if someone sold you three clunkers, would you buy another one? And people get really offended by that. But the reality is, if somebody gets like four or five translations wrong, are you really going to believe not only Joseph Smith, but the leaders today that they speak to God when everything we have that can evaluate the truth claims of the Mormon church is telling us it is absolutely wrong. And, and you know, one of the things, being a convert, I guess maybe it was easier for me to kind of look at it a little differently because I didn't have a childhood that was told this is the only way, but I never needed anyone to prove Mormonism true. I never needed anyone to prove the Book of Mormon true. But what I needed was that you could not prove the Book of Mormon false, that you could not prove that the Book of Mormon is not history. And so when people say you have to have faith, I say faith is the belief in what you can't see, what you can't know. It is not belief in spite of what you can see. And so this is an area where you can see with your own eyes, with your own ears, you can look at these things and understand Joseph Smith and all of the people after until 1980 told us that this was a prophetic translation, partial as it may be, by Joseph Smith. It's wrong. And so not only did Joseph Smith get it wrong, but every leader after got it wrong as well. All right. Well, that takes us to the final slide, which is the conclusion of today's presentation. 
Yeah, and so kind of like I talked about at the beginning, the reason I like the Kinderhook plates is because it goes beyond um, just the headline that Joseph Smith claimed a partial translation of a fraudulent set of plates. That by itself is a bombshell. I do believe sometimes as a critic we overstated a little bit, but the fact is he did make a partial translation of a set of plates that were fraudulent. Um, <laughs> but for me, the takeaways beyond that are really important. Uh, one is that, as we talk about, Joseph Smith lacked the power of discernment to know he was being conned, and that was a perfect opportunity for Joseph Smith to to really unleash his prophetic calling, and yet he failed. Um, the Gale for the um, Egyptian alphabet for the Book of Abraham was 100% done by Joseph Smith and was not reverse engineered, as apologists want to claim, um, in order to excuse the completely incorrect translations. So the Kinderhook plates make the missing slash long scroll theory of the Book of Abraham dead on arrival. Um, it was quite possible in the 19th century to create a set of prop plates in metal um, that were intricate and bound, just like Joseph Smith could have done with the Book of Mormon. Um, I realize an apologist might say that Fugate and them had a group and they had a blacksmith. The point is Joseph Smith did not show anyone the engravings on the plate, so it would be very easy for him to just take sheets of tin and bound them in the 1820s. Dan Vogel has talked about that in great length and shown how it would have been very easy for him to do. And the Kinderhook plates show the absurdity of treasure digging, uh, which is something to me um, that shows Joseph Smith recognized when being asked uh, about the plates when he said he wanted to send it to multiple antiquarian societies uh, to be verified instead of just asking God, considering that Joseph Smith could get revelation on just about anything. And yet on the Kinderhook plates, he tells him, I want to send them off to a bunch of, of these antiquarian societies. Um, wouldn't you think he would just pray to God? And so I think it just shows the weakness of Joseph Smith's ability to get revelation again when he's not controlling the situation. Yeah. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, Nemo, anything you want to add? It's just, yeah, it's an old trope, but uh, Joseph Smith gets an angel with a drawn sword coming to make it very clear to him that he has to marry underage girls, but he has to send off to an antiquarian society to do his one main job, which is to translate ancient scripture and bring it forth. That was what he was called to do. He wasn't called to establish polygamy, uh, at least not initially. That wasn't his mandate. His mandate was to translate ancient words and bring them forth and bring forth the fullness of the gospel that way. So. Yeah. You know, God's priorities are askew. Joseph Smith's priorities in what he asks for and what he sends off to antiquarian societies are askew. And as a translator, I don't rate him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, well, and, and your point about the angel with the drawn sword, I feel like we could do that in a lot of episodes. But yeah, it's perfect. Because again, you, you have to remember, the Mormon version of God's priority to send an angel down with a drawn sword is to make Joseph Smith marry and have sex with... Um, followers that tend to be young and attractive, or I should just say young. We don't know if they were attractive. Um, and yet when we have issues like um, the Kinderhook plates, the angel is just apparently not going to come down and tell Joseph, don't do that. Or when he's translating the book of Abraham wrong, no angel. And, and so over and over again, we see this pattern where the things that God seems to want are the things Joseph Smith wants and is in control of. And when Joseph Smith loses control, God kind of, the Mormon version of God disappears completely. And, and that should be a pretty good sign that Joseph Smith is the one that's in control of these revelations and, and of these claimed, you know, decrees from God. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to share a, a scripture that I've already referenced, but I'm just going to share it one more time and make a final point. If we're looking at the modern uh, Doctrine and Covenants section 21, verse 1, it says, Behold, there shall be a record kept among you, and in it thou shalt be called. This is Jesus Christ himself, uh, according to the Doctrine and Covenants, talking about Joseph Smith. Um, and thou shalt be called a seer, a translator, a prophet, an apostle of Jesus Christ, an elder of the church, through the will of God the Father and the grace of your Lord Jesus Christ. And so there we've got the Doctrine and Covenants and Jesus himself, Mormon Jesus himself, declaring Joseph Smith as a translator. And the reason why that's a problem, number one, is we have basically another example of the scriptures being wrong. Clearly, Joseph wasn't a translator. But for me, why this is really crucial is that, that we all can remember how we started this whole LDS Discussions episode, which is with Joseph Smith as a treasure digger. And what we know is, is that even though he was never able to find any treasure, he was still able to convince people that he had the power to find buried treasure and the power to use uh, a seer stone in a hat 
to to do magic. Basically, he was a magical person who had magical artifacts that he could either find treasure with or later with the Book of Mormon, the pivot with the Book of Mormon was to pivot from using a seer stone in a hat to find buried treasure, pivoting to using the Book of Mormon seer stone, sorry, using the seer stone in the hat to translate alleged golden plates by the gift and power of God into scripture. So this translator claim is a really important bridge from his fraudulent folk magic treasure digging days to his claim to be uh, a man of God, a prophet, seer, and revelator, a, a, a leader of a new religious movement. And so if, if that claim of being a translator fails, it fails on the back of his claims to be able to find buried treasure also failing those two dominoes fall, then where is the credibility um, of him being a prophet of the restoration? And and it's a it's an important bait and switch because you would not have Brigham Young and 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 all of the people in Kirtland and and uh, Missouri and in Nauvoo. You probably wouldn't have them following and believing in Joseph Smith if they had known that not only was his treasure digging attempts proven to be fraudulent, but that his translation attempts were also proven to be fraudulent, you probably wouldn't have a bunch of people being being willing to testify that he was a prophet of Jesus and being willing to follow him. To me, it's it's just a really important domino. No, it is. And, that, and that's why we talk about watching all these episodes in order to try to understand when we try to call back to earlier ones, because yeah, if, if church members knew the book of Abraham is considered a, fall, a, a bad translation by literally everyone that's not employed by the church and the Kinderhook plates, uh, what they claim they were, what all of the leaders claim they were, I mean, you're not going to have members who are going to go, oh, that's that's a prophet I can depend on. They're going to go, what, what the crap is going on here? Because now we're seeing that Joseph Smith is getting it wrong every time we can assess his, his claims. And that is why I think the Kinderhook plates are really important because it's just another way to verify not just the Kinderhook plates, but the book of Abraham and treasure digging, those are all tied into this. And all of them are telling us that this is not something that's coming from God, but is coming from Joseph Smith. All right. Well, I think we made the case today. Um, Mike, normally you have to run or run at this point, I yeah. think. Um, I but do, I just yeah. want to say, you know, check out the LDS Discussions essay on the Kinderhook Plates. Uh, we'll provide a link to it in the show notes. And then, Mike, we still have at least another 10 or 12 episodes to go, including an overview of Joseph Smith's translations, where I think we're going to be summarizing kind of how we concluded today. But we've got the spiritual witnesses and testimonies of the Book of Mormon, how the church handles doubt, several episodes on revelations, um, the tr transfiguration of Brigham Young, Mormonism and apologetics, uh, some summaries about Joseph Smith. But, you know, we're down to the last 10 or 12 episodes of, as we've currently envisioned, the LDS discussion series. That's kind of, well, it's kind of sad, but also exciting. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of good stuff left. And then I think when we get near the end, we'll try to see what we can maybe add in because there's a lot of topics that I think people have asked where we haven't done. So we're not, we're, we still got a while to go and, and, and um, looking forward to, picking back up with you. And um, it, like I said, there, there's a lot of fun stuff left. And, it, and a lot of what's left is going to tie back to what we've already done. I think that's what makes this valuable because of the fact it can tie these things together in a way that I think um, undercuts this idea that they're all one-off problems, but they're, they're more patterns and they're more themes that help us to understand it better. But even if it kind of sucks to go through it in the first place. All right. Um, I'm going to quickly ask anyone who is uh, watching us on YouTube or who has a YouTube account, I'm going to just ask you explicitly. We just we we passed ninety thousand YouTube subscribers while this interview was being recorded. That's a huge accomplishment because once you hit a hundred thousand, YouTube actually sends you a plaque. And it, and it, and why all that's important? Number one, if you subscribe to YouTube, 
it it allows you to be notified when another important cool new episode releases but it also really helps the algorithms in the sense that the the more popular a youtube channel is the more youtube is willing to advertise and promote your episodes so please take the time right now to go subscribe to the mormon stories podcast youtube channel if you haven't that's really important for us but i also want to say as we thank nemo for coming on today please also go to the nemo the Mormon YouTube channel and subscribe there because Nemo does brilliant work and he deserves our support. So Nemo, any final words? Mike already had to bail. Any final words you have well, for us? Just thank you for that. It's been a pleasure and an honor being here. Uh, I'm at almost at a much smaller milestone. I'm almost at 10,000. Uh, That's which, great. You know, I'm I'm thrilled with, so I can't really be self-deprecating like that as I normally am. Um, and just thanks to everyone that supports what I do and supports what I do here as well. Um, yeah, I, I love being part of this and uh, I'm just grateful to be here. All right, Nemo. Well, we adore you and we're grateful for your friendship and for your uh, participation uh, and for your, your work independently in Mormon Stories. So keep up the good work, Nemo. Thank you. We'll All do. right. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today on Mormon Stories. I want to thank everyone who's helped us have such a wonderful year in 2022. That's Gerardo. That's Anthony. That's Brooklyn. That's Maven. That's, uh, you know, so many people, uh, Margie and Samantha and Kara and John Larson. And uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting people. So many people who have been super helpful, Justin and others. Thanks to everyone who's helped make Mormon Stories successful. Thanks to all the donors that have donated to Mormon Stories podcast. We couldn't do this without your donations. And if you do value this LDS discussion series or Mormon Stories in general, we need your support to keep paying everybody and to uh, to keep this all financially sustainable. So if you haven't yet, please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button at the top of the page, become a monthly donor. You're, it's tax deductible in the U.S., um, we're transparent in our finances, and we do our best to make sure that every dollar you spend um, or donate to Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation is used to further the mission. I also want to thank Clint Martin and uh, and Carrie Whitbeck as our uh, board members for all that they do to make all this possible as well. So uh, thanks, to everyone, for joining us today. Please share this with anyone you want to. Be good to each other, be kind to each other, and we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast and of the LDS Discussion Series, which is available on Spotify in audio and video format, in the Apple Podcasting app, and on YouTube in the playlist on the Mormon Stories Podcast page. Thanks, everybody. Take care, and we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Bye-bye.